And we're live. Tony Moran, welcome to the podcast. I'm so honoured that you've uh, decided to accept the invite and come on and have a chat to us. Um, old friends, we go back away. Um, and I just wanted to bring you on because I think your story is so great. It's so inspirational and it's <clears throat> it's got everything. So I, I think it's about time that people heard it and, and we can go through it today. But before we do, because it's happening right now and people are being affected by it right now, is that you're a PT, you work in gyms, and in Liverpool we've been targeted by this rampant Tory government uh, for a local lockdown, a tier three, the most serious lockdown that anyone can get. Um, and they've closed the pubs, they closed you know, other businesses and gyms in particular. Now, the rumour is, is that the gyms through their resistance in Liverpool and them defying these laws have got to the point where they're negotiating with the council, they're negotiating with the police and the restrictions are talking about being lifted. Now, I don't know whether that's true or not, it's just a rumour. Um, can you tell me about what your experience is up to this point, dealing with the COVID situation from your professional perspective and personal if you want to and you know give us a an, an insight if you can about what's happening right now okay and thanks for that welcome it's nice to be here nice to see you based on what you've just asked me from the beginning march it was it was difficult for us all in that industry also in the other industry that i work in which is the nighttime industry because i work security and i, I manage doors in town so we've been affected doubly in those two industries. And a lot of people who do work in gyms also work in the security industry for obvious reasons. So there's a lot of people similar to me. I'm a family man with five children, so in that respect, it was a little daunting at first. But over the six-month period, I've become very comfortable, I've got to be honest with you. It's been probably for me, best time of my life and that time might sound strange to some people that I'm not trying to paint a picture of I'm in control of everything but that's probably the reason why it's been a good time because I've realised I'm in control of nothing in, in, in this life as such so I've come to terms with that and I was already on that path anyway to understanding that part of myself so for me personally um, it's been a good time and it's been a good time of reflection and understanding of, of who I am as a person and I've become stronger through it. And I like to lead by example, and I always, probably always have done in my life. Um, and I've got a lot of clients who look up to me, a lot of people who look up to me. I've got five children who look up to me. Uh, so I, like, I do like to lead by example, and I take that strength and resilience forward into what I do, I believe, because I, I get reflections of that from people. So it's important for me to, to set a good standard and to... to to show what I preach at practice. And I, I do believe I do that. So I know I'm not really answering the question fully in the way that you, you, you asked it. But I, and I see a lot of disheartened people around and I, I'm very supportive of, of the whole community. I'm very supportive of everyone, I've got to be honest with you. I'm a supportive type of person. So I get involved, I'm, active, I'm actively involved and I'm trying to promote a way to a way to a way to deal with it that's peaceful and that doesn't leave people in a, in a worse position, including myself, because I am active and I'm out there, and I don't want to. Uh, you know, there's a, there's a lot of potential threats, not because of the type of person I am, but because of the situation you may find yourself in, because you are actively involved, and we all understand what that means. So. Are you back in work? I mean, is your gym open currently? I mean, are you, are you still going? No, the gym isn't open, but my client group is, <coughs> is uh, so dedicated to me, I'd say. So you as a, I, as a personal go, trainer? So I go outdoors with people. Yeah. My main job is security. So I um, that's been affected mostly. I don't know at all if I'm going to be getting any type of uh, support with that. 
but I've got a lot of good friends. I've got a lot of support. I've, I've done a lot of good deeds in my life, and I've got a lot of good karma, I believe. And I've I've noticed that this last six months, I've had a lot of a lot of support off a lot of people in a, in a lot of ways. That that is that has reminded me that it's good to be good, it's good so, to be a good person. So those six months are you talking about when um, the first part of the lockdown and most of us had to spend a lot of time at home that we normally wouldn't do is. Is that what you found yourself doing? Because I know you're a very busy, active guy and you're out there and putting yourself out there wherever it needs to be done. Did you find you were spending more time at home? <laughs> <laughs> a lot more time, but it was, it was that, <laughs> based on what you just said, yeah. It's probably the first time in like 30 years I've had a rest. Mm. And that's, that's, that's probably not no, no exaggeration. Mm. And that may be explained further on in our conversation, but... It was it was nice to me, and yeah. I spend the time with the kids a lot more quality time, more quality time with my partner. I was resting. As long as I can pay my bills, which I wouldn't say I do with that much. No, if I can we, uh, pay our dual household bills, if as long as I can cover me weight, then I'm a happy man. What do you think about the current situation? With um, it feels as if it's a tinder box in Liverpool at the moment. It feels as if we've been targeted by the government. Don't know why. Um, and it feels as if there is a strong resistance, a building rebellion, and it's being led by people who run gyms because they've got the discipline, they've got the muscle, and they're not afraid. What are your what's your reading of that on Liverpool? Reading of it generally, and I know mixed with a lot of people worldwide over over social media. Let's have it right, social media. But the people that I've connected with through through to the fighting combat sports that I've been involved in all my life. So friend in America, friends worldwide who we communicate with. And one I've noticed quite clearly, and this is no disrespect to, to friends of mine and people who aren't fighters, but I've noticed a very, very obvious theme. And that obvious theme is that people who live, very careful I would say this, but fighting men are men. Fighting men have a certain way of approaching problems in the world, and it's not always about violence. I'm not talking about it like that. I'm talking about it in terms of your resilience and the metal that is formed within you if you're a true competitor. And you know, and that that'll probably go for people who do other things of a strenuous, tough nature. But there's a, there's a, there's a different mindset to approaching adversity, and I've. Um, I've been sculpted through adversity, I feel. Taught me life through the things I've done. Uh, I've, I've been willing to suffer physically to grow spiritually. Mm -hmm. And I've grown spiritually to physical endeavour. Uh, so, I've got a different viewpoint. And my viewpoint doesn't always fit. <laughs> well, that's good. No, <laughs> it doesn't no. always fit with other people. But that's but. good. You know, let's, I want to hear that viewpoint because, you know, uh, you're someone who I respect immensely. So, you know, tell me your viewpoint. Expand on. Yeah, the, the, the structure of a man who, okay, look, if you look at uh, a military man, I've got a good military friend, and the, these are these are men through and through, and you've seen and you've done and seen things that only those type of men are going to encounter. Not everyone deals with it well, but there's the individuals that I know have grown from the experience because they've they've allowed the experience to um, develop them rather than crush them similar to me your vibe attracts your tribe type of thing I've got a, a lot of I've got a lot of solid friends who are uh, just and there's a lot of women out there by the way I'm not just saying about men um, but you know I'm a man my friends are mostly men or they are all men so that's just the way it is that's how I see the world and I see I see these men rising up and speaking out and they're speaking the truth I speak my truth and sometimes it takes a lot to do that because I've I've branched over from being a fighter and a, and a you know, what do you call a doorman? You know what I mean, with a certain type of. But people know that I've also got this other sort of thread to me, which is I'm quite a quite spiritual a spiritual philosopher. Spiritual, philosopher. yeah, and I write poetry, yeah. and, and yeah. you know, and I'm not I'm a warrior, not a warrior shame. poet. That's I'm not what it is. Yeah, I'm not ashamed to to, yeah, to, to speak to speak me truth. It's it, it's a it's a very um, it's a very specific role in in, in history is the warrior poet. Is the poet, you know, who can 
speak about the you know the, the human condition at the same time he can kick ass <laughs> I like that. It's a really interesting dynamic, isn't it? Because it feels as if they should be polar opposites, but when they combine them in one man and one person, that can create, you know, a lot of uh, a lot of friction. I've a, I'm aware that I'm aware of the way I'm I'm seeing like that, and it's not lost on me, and, and it's something not something I've I've, I've used to my advantage. It's just it's just do I am, do you know what I mean? Mm. But I am aware that that's a. A valuable part of me because because I, I transferred it to my children and my children are, are growing to be similar type individuals and you can have both I believe. So okay, so let's let's um, we'll move on from this. We'll finish up on on. Uh, so in all, we think it's a positive thing at the moment that the the gyms are fighting back and and uh, being the the you know at the vanguard of this rebellion. You know, let's call it what it is, and I think it's a good thing. Yeah. Nice to see people standing together for the change. Yeah. I yeah. like that. I like cool. that aspect of it. Um, okay, so when I was researching for this chat, going deep into your career and your story, I challenge anyone who has a look at it not to be inspired by it, yeah? And even your, you know, your moniker, which is uh, There's a Dream, yeah? And it's, it's, it's like a movie script, and I think it's great. So tell me about... You know, tell me about your beginnings, Tony. Tell me about how how you decided to become a man of combat. You know, a fighter. Where did it all start? Um, can I re really release the location of where we're at now? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so this particular location in Anfield, I lived half a mile that way. Did you grow up there? So yeah, I grew up on Shield Road, another, Kensington. Another piece of beautiful synchronicity, I love it. <laughs> so I used to walk from that house mm. to the gym, my first karate dojo, which was... The Red just, Triangle? No, just past Stanfield Football Ground it was. Okay. So um, so why did you, let me, before we go on? Oh yeah, I'm going to explain okay, that. Yeah. So growing up, I was a very mild-mannered, gentle kid. Very much the same as I am now as an individual, but I just couldn't fight. <laughs> <laughs> I had no clue how to fight. I had no brothers. My dad was a very gentle man. I had no... Only child? No, I had no real... No, two sisters. Okay. But I had no male... Male... Machismo influence in my okay. life. Every every man in my family is a gentle human being. Beautiful human beings. I'm, I'm blessed to come from such a big family. But such a be I mean, they are just beautiful people. I know you only realise this as you get older. Mm -hmm. But it's a, it's a beautiful clan. You know I mean? Irish. Yeah. 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 Well, <laughs> Irish Italian. Okay. That's interesting. Got, I'm, I'm a 16th Italian. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> What's the Italian side's name? Burano. Toshini. <laughs> Toshini. <laughs> Toshini. That was my great granddad. Yeah. So uh, he was a strong man, by the way. Yeah. He was a, he was a, he was a, but a beautiful. Your great granddad. Yeah. But, and he was Italian. But he was like my, my height, but. Your wit, yeah. He, was, he couldn't even speak English. Do you think the the fighting gene came through him? God knows. Yeah. Okay. I'll tell you about the Maasai Maran body you after. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, I'm from I'm from I'm from good stock in, in terms of like morality and mm -hmm. you know just uh, the humanness of the family that I'm from. So I'm blessed in that way. Did you have a good relationship with your mum and dad growing up? Yeah, but it was tough because you know. Poverty and, and yeah. all the things that go with poverty were, were tough on us, but you know I don't want to make I don't want to talk about cliches. We've gone past cliches in my life, but we had a loving household, with hard working parents, but they struggled. My parents struggled as as, as adults, you know what I mean. And I obviously witnessed that as a child, and that can that can leave a little bit of a a taint to you to you growing up as you're looking up at these people who it's might an be insecurity, isn't it? Oh, massively, mm. yeah. So. But I've come to terms with all of it. I've, I've had deep conversations with everyone in my life about everything. I'm not. I'm not shy in any way, shape, or form to speak about emotional stuff. So getting back to my childhood, so everything was going perfect. I, I remember. Have you ever seen the Wonder Years? That program, the yeah. Wonder Years. Yeah, Channel Four. I, I, whether I'm just <laughs> yeah. delusional, but I, I pitched my childhood like that. It was lovely. I remember it being nice. Do you know what I mean? So. But when you get to 12, 13, <laughs> and you go to senior school, life changes abruptly, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. So, like, was you always tall, Tony? Was you? No, I wasn't. No. no. But I've always. You're six foot seven, aren't you? I'm six foot seven now. Six yeah. foot seven. I'm yeah. six foot four and a half. I can't yeah. remember when I shot up, but I remember looking back at 14 when I was 14 and that karate told you I meant to do I was pretty tall then. Like yeah. Like, 40s from the echo and stuff. So, 
so I was very skinny as well. Like I'd be, I'd be a bean pole without training because my my structure is like um, just, just skin and bone. You know what I mean? So yeah. I, I built a body yeah. all the time. So I was a skinny kid, <laughs> lovely kid, mild mannered kid, gentle kid, and that got me through because. Because I was, I think I was such a warm, friendly individual. Mm-hmm. I didn't get bullied, so that was a blessing. Until you get to senior school and, and the world changes, <clears throat> and then there's kids who are like 13, 14, 15, and then maybe, Where did you go? Our Lady of Fatima. So I had a friend, Alan. Uh, Alan, I'll tell you about Alan in a minute. I'll be walking home from school. Do you remember, remember Everly Street? Everly Street. Yeah, Everly. 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 I went to St. Michael's Junior School and there was a street called Everly Street with the Everly Street Gang. <laughs> Do you call the Everly Street Gang? Everyone was shit scared of them. And we walked around and got chased by the Everly Street Gang. <laughs> Big time. And I said to Alan, you didn't want to remind me the other week? Because Alan became a standout, uh, amazing karate champion as well. And he went to Red Triangle. And I said to him, Alan, we need to go, <laughs> we need to, go to karate and be able to protect ourselves. <laughs> to make our way over to the Everly Gang. Yeah, I'm not even messing. <laughs> mad. You only remind me the other week, I couldn't even remember it. Yeah. But, you know, I'll take him out his word. So we went to Red Triangle. And he I went, went to Red Triangle. Yeah, and I went to this local, low Joe this way. That was the that was the, the 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 more standout place. It's Red Triangle. But I knew someone who had links there. And so I grew I, up I grew up on Oakfield Road. Well it was yeah. um the Norwich the Norwich the Norwich Street. Oh, what was that yeah. in the road? Begin with a V. It was it was in the school, it was a dojo. That would Valley uh, Road. No, I'm not sure I begin with a V, Vernon Street, or something like that. But anyway, so I I had a family member who connected me to that one. So that's why I went there and Alan went there. I remember going the first night there and um I was recounting this story to two of my younger clients yesterday. And this fella had an air what do you call an air shield? Do you know what an air shield is? No. So it's like a big pad that you hold and then you can kick it. Yeah. And I'm standing in line, this little skinny kid, you know what I mean? And, you know, I was confident, but I, I didn't feel confident in, in that particular place because it was full of grown men and tough looking men and stuff. And, t- and karate was tough back in them days. Mm-hmm. It, was, it was a tough, it was a tough man. Um, and it was big as well. Chuck Norris, Bruce Lee. Mm-hmm. Spawned a lot of those, a lot of karate skills. So I'm standing in line and it comes to my turn to kick the pad and I kicked the pad that a big man was old and looked big to me anyway at the time. And I sent him flying <laughs> and it got like a few little slaps on the back and around, you know what I mean? And I felt good. I wasn't, so, I wasn't good at sport. So was this the first time you felt any kind of self-esteem in terms yes, of your natural talent? exactly that. Yeah. Exactly that. Yeah. So I just held on to that with dear life. Yeah. And I, now I was age 12 then, right? And I stopped fighting at 42. And that. So I know that was I. I understand what you've just said. You found something you love. No, what you just said was through that mm. self-esteem thing, mm. and and it rose in me because I wasn't good at any sport up mm. until that point because I wasn't getting guided towards anything. My dad didn't look, you know, I love my dad, but he never guided me towards nothing. He just got left alone at that age, and and them in them times, you just got left Crack here. On. Just you go on to form me on a Saturday at the age yeah, of eight, yeah. done whatever you wanted at that age, yeah. in that environment. And it wasn't too lack of love, it was just too, a different time. It was just, just a different culture, the wasn't 70s, it? Yeah. Well, yeah, I grew up in the 70s, but you know, by the time I got to I was in the 80s. So effectively, yeah, that was me realising I was good at something. And I wasn't doing it because I wanted to be a fighter and I wanted to go and beat people up. I wanted to do it because I wanted us to be good at something yeah. and, be, and be respected for being good at something. You found so, your thing... Your one thing. That one thing. It could have been anything, no, yeah. get what I mean? Yeah. It could have been anything. And within a year, so I I was, I was every night, hours and hours and hours, practice, practice, practice. Within a year. At home? I, yeah. Won my first British karate title. Wow. And I got dropped off at the end of the road there. Tell me about it. Tell me about Tell me about that. The, the day the, before. The fight. Tell me about the, fa- the fight that you won the title. But it wasn't because karate was like karate kid. Where you go to a series <laughs> of different fights and like you get to the final. Like and you win, and stuff. Oh my, I remember <laughs> it reminded me now it's, it's all flashing back and it's like yeah. wow. I remember the day before being at my nan's, walking to the shop and like how how, how I mean I could taste how much. It's like it was like whoa, I need to. Win. You know what I mean? I knew it was going to change my life. I don't mm-hmm. know. I didn't know how. I was, mm-hmm. I was only a kid, but it was a deep, 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 deep desire. More. More so than even realise until I've just explained it to you. Mm. Mm. It was deep. And um so I can only say that was the, the catalyst for it all then. Mm. And then from that that point of being thirteen, I didn't I I didn't lose 
the title, so to speak, of being a national karate champion until the age of 26. So from boy to man, Hell I was a national it. karate champion all the way through. Wow. Then I went on to represent Great Britain, blah, 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 blah. So let's talk about karate. Yeah. Mm. And uh, we were chatting about it the other day, about, you know, is it real? Is it is it just a sport? Is it something, you know, it, is it just something that is um, meant for fun? In terms of, would you use karate when you're, when you're fighting in MMA or, you know, anything like that? Is it, or is it part of this kind of myth? <laughs> well, like WWF. Yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> well, it, in, what, what gives you that perception? Because in the sense that it's a sport of, yeah. like, um, minimal combat and minimal contact. Depends which type of karate you're talking about. Okay, well, so to educate me, because if, I feel so, as if there's, there's, like, so, a, there's so like, a movie style, a movie style wow. you know, karate and... Well, I've got to give it the credit to the deserves because it's, it's, it's an amazing, it's an amazing fighting. Yeah, art, you know I mean? Mart a martial arts, you know. Has karate made it into MMA, or has yeah. it been chased out of MMA? For those who have practiced it, because mm. it, it it is a dying sort of um, sport. You call it a sport? I don't know. It's even right to call it a sport. It, it's a martial art, you know what I mean? It's, it's been formed in the past to to protect people who were, were probably weaponless at the time. So mm -hmm. I, I, I couldn't explain the history of it, but I, I know bits and bobs, you know what I mean? But my former karate, so there's shoulder cam where my mate Alan went to in the triangle. You've got the likes of Frank Brennan there. Mm -hmm. You know, you stand out. And if Frank Brennan hits you, <laughs> you know with one it. shot. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Same as Alfie Lewis, who was one of my instructors. So was Alfie Lewis karate, was he? Yeah, but he formed his own style of karate uh, called freestyle karate. Okay. And back in the day, in the in the, the late 70s and 80s, in Toxted, there was this group of men led by Alfie. Mm. And then you had um, Peter O'Para, you had AJ, the fellow who, who uh, lost his life on Granby. I mean, they were that. serious men, weren't they? Listen, yeah. they, were a, yeah. they were a team of, yeah. of... And I used to go to tournaments as a kid, watching them, thinking... I. So get on this, here's, here's a little story for you. On my bedroom wall at the age of 12 in a, in a, in a, a dilapidated house in Kenny, mm. with not even any plaster on my bedroom walls, it was the dilapidated terraced house in Kenny. Mm. <laughs> and it looked like that, with one pane of glass in the main. I used to leave a drink in my, in my bedroom and went and I'd freeze overnight. It was a, <laughs> it was a cold box room of like... And sometimes I got depressed in there as a kid. Yeah. It, it wasn't, uh, you know... As I was getting into me 12 and, and you start looking at other kids, you got all that nice clobber on, you, and you're living in this house and you're thinking, fuck me, do you know what I mean? So that was a, a major drive for us. But the story I'm going to tell you, I had a poster on my wall of Alfie Lewis as, as winning his world title championship. Now... Everyone has other, has, has other. He wasn't an icon, but he was at that time. Yeah. Do you understand what I mean? Yeah. I'm proud to say I've never had idols or icons, but I love I love people and respected them for their mm. abilities and the, and 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 the, what, they did, what what they'd achieved. Yeah. yeah. So we use my face. So and I'm looking, used to, and then I get to train. You know what I mean? So a series of events where I, I believe in law of attraction. I mm. really do. I believe in like you can set your own course. I didn't know that at the time, but if I look back to my life now and the experiences I've had, I feel like Forrest Gump. You followed it instinctively, and, and now you've become. I was just this man, man, a kid who had these yeah. amazing. I've had these amazing experiences yeah. through my life that I would have. I would have died for at that age. Everything I dreamed of at that age, I've, I've, I've realised that makes sense. Yeah. I've realised me. I've realised my dreams, but not being respectful enough of realising them when I've realised them until now. So, so you were around Alfie Lewis and all that crew during your formative years as a karate champion. No, no. I went to Anfield, the one on Anfield first, because mm. I got everyone was saying you can't go to Toxteth at that. You know what I mean? Toxteth yeah. tries to be on. Yeah, you don't, don't go there. You're gonna yeah. get done. You won't get and out. Their, and their team was formidable. Yeah. Apparently you went there, you just got done in. I was only a kid. We yeah. going, I weren't going to travel to Tokyo to get done in by men. Okay. You know I, mean? yeah. so I was getting done in by men <laughs> down here. But I was getting done in by men until I was 14 and I must have shot up. And no one was doing it in there. I was kind. I mean, I'd be, I was a kid. Mm. And um, But by the time I reached 14, I was, I was giving it to men. So what, do you, what men. do you think about, about that period where you were... Taking it hard and as a kid, I mean, how do you look back on that now? Is that something that you feel as if it was oh, a nightmare or or something that helped form the man you are today? I can't, I can't look back on any of my so-called negative experiences and see them as negative anymore because I think I've grown. 
to an extent where I, I see them all as blessings, if that makes sense. So I can I can reflect on it and give you an understanding of how I might have felt, but I can't feel like that no more. Does that make sense? Yeah, because I'm into I've been getting into David Goggins at the moment, right? Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And just an incredible human being, truly inspirational and has had a quite of um, an effect upon me personally and his story is about you know the suffering he went through as a kid and his childhood and stuff like that and that suffering helped him it helped him to become tough you know and it helped him later on in life and he, even though he had a really bad childhood experience is that he doesn't look back at it in negativity he, he sees that as as part of his particular life journey and it shaped him into the man he is today you know so um and I fully recognise and, and believe yeah. in that as well. Yeah, it's it's that it's that adversity, that suffering. That, cause I thought one of the things he's talked about was that he had to make a callus in the mind. You know, if you play guitar, you have to you know spend a week or two getting your fingers hard. Well, he put himself through suffering in order to make his mind tough, so that he could endure these tough physical pursuits. You know, and it seems to me that you've had similar. Um, experiences that have toughened you up for the bigger ones that have been waiting for you to head? We've all got a path, I think. Mm. But, uh, yeah, yeah, I, I agree. I think, I think I do agree. got to speak from my own heart on this one, but I, I, I was prepared to suffer at that time because I knew it was going to lead to something better than where I was. And where I was didn't make sense. And I didn't. I remember looking in, in the bedroom mirror when I was about 13. I got a very vivid, I can remember things vividly from when I was three. Vividly. And I've recounted these to people. So I know there's not, now here's another surprising thing. I've had 30 years of blunt head trauma at a, a very consistent, high, tremendous level. I've had two fractured skulls. But I feel. I feel like my brain works better now at 47. More space to move. <laughs> make, make, no, but I mean, think yeah. about that. 30 years of blunt trauma to the head. Mm. Some heavy, heavy blows. So do you think it's overrated? That Not sorry, overrated. Do you, think it's, not, sorry, no, uh, do you think it's... Um, do you think the fear factor that um, certain elements of society likes to impose upon combat sports and says, you know, this is not good for you, this is not good for you, but... You know, like you said yourself, is that you're probably getting smarter <laughs> as you get older, aren't you? <laughs> you know what? I, I'm not going to agree or disagree with it, but <laughs> this is what I believe. <clears throat> probably going a bit esoteric here, but I believe my path was set. I had to, I had to go through those experiences, and something, something greater than me is, is because I can't, I can't. I've tried to work out how me because I've been for brain scans, and he said my brain looks fine. And I know, I know the trauma my head is taken. So I think, how oh, how is that possible? So I've had to heal myself to the fact that I don't, I don't buy into it, and I don't. So I'm a great believer in that as well. I believe you can heal your own body. Absolutely. I really do believe that, and I've, I've healed, I've healed from some just very serious injuries with, with the power of the mind. If you want to talk about the power of the mind, but we'll get to that. So let's. Let's get, get back to the karate, right? So you became the champion. It was You held your title for quite a long time. And then when did you decide to move into the next phase of your life? When did you move from this karate champion into the next phase, which was the boxing, wasn't it? So there was an intermittent period between me. So I'm trying to recount the time. I think I was 15. Going to Our Lady of Fatima, and there's a, there a boxing gym named um, Evan Red Triangle. Right, so I go to Evan Red Triangle, and I, I found out I was, I was as good at boxing as I was at karate. Just, I just, just took to that like a duck to water as well. But I got bad eyes, and I couldn't pass the eyesight test. So even no one knew I wanted to do boxing more than karate. I wasn't allowed to. When we go going home to my mars. That night, I was, I was, I was. I was is feeling. this because there's more contact? Well, no, but it is. What I learned is that when you're short sighted, like I am, um, I'm probably, probably pretty bad. Like your face is a blur to me now. Well, I've got contact lenses, and otherwise you'd be a blur. <laughs> but I had my glasses on, but I couldn't wear them with this. Ah, uh, right, okay. So your face is a blur to me. I know yeah. who you are, but <laughs> you know what I mean. <laughs> but there's no definition to your to your features. So. When you go for the eyesight test with the with the amateurs, it's a doctor in the room covering your eye, reading off a uh, a letterboard. 
it was just, it was just, it was just not, it was not it was just fuzz to me. There was no way I was passing an eyesight test like that. In the pros, <laughs> uh, I don't know if I can say this. <laughs> I blagged it. Yeah, I blagged it. Yeah, I found a way to blag it. Go on, tell me the way. Will it leave me in an illegal sort of no. mix up? No, it's, it's well in the past, isn't it? <laughs> it is, yeah. <laughs> the statute of limitations is in place, mate, so after six years. I have to right. find them. So here, here's the, well, I'll say the rest of the story. And so yeah. I was, I, I knew at 16 or 15, whatever that age period was, that I wanted to be a boxer. Mike Tyson does come out. So this is, so okay, this, this is the so final moment, thi- isn't it? So t- at 12, yeah. around 15 to 16, I go yeah. to Evan Red Triangle, spend like six months to a year there, go for me medical, get Get, get dismissed gutted because I knew because mm. I, I already knew at that age the difference because I'm seeing Mike Tyson on the telly I'm not seeing karate fellas on the telly I'm seeing all these box you know and whoever, whoever they were they he were was the, just incredible they, wasn't he yeah, yeah but I'm seeing fame and fortune on the telly yeah. I'm not seeing that through karate okay so I want to be a boxer now I want the fame and the fortune that's going to help me escape the life I'm not, I'm not happy with in terms of the financial stuff that, that we haven't got so I want a better life that was all based on that was me train of thought, I can't even remember at the time. Get dismissed, go back to karate, spend a couple of years partying, smashing around, go to Alfie's when I'm 20, 20, 21, and then carried on becoming successful and competitor got joined doing the Great Britain squad. I had a good time, do you know what I mean? But by the time I got to 26, I, I was getting a bit bored of it. And I wanted, I wanted to fulfil this dream that I had to be a boxing world champion. And at the age of 15, or 16, whichever it was. I remember in school, in that Lady of Fatima, inscribing on the desk that Tony Moran, world boxing champion. That was it. That was my message to myself. With on a on a wooden desk with a gem with those um what were they called? The metal the metal scraping on. Mm. You used to put your pencil and draw compass. Compass, yeah. I just bored in school listening to the teacher going on. I just I just because I might have heard a story of someone saying, like, you know, I can't remember why I done it, but I did it. Um, so that was a, that was a pivotal, that was a strange pivotal thing that I done. And then I never gave up on that dream. As much as much as like there, was, there didn't seem to be a way for me to fulfil that dream. I had to find a way. I had to find a way to went to the return there to see Jimmy Albo and begged him to let me to let me you know to find a way to do the, the test for me because I wanted to become an amateur fighter. Because I knew the importance of building the pedigree as a boxer. Didn't happen. Waited another two, just messed around for another two years. Opened the kickboxing club on Shield Road. That's another good one. So I served the community, fulfilling the obligations to, to give back, which I did. And then um, I think I was 28. I had to find a way. And one of me, cli- one of me, not cli- one call them client, but one of the students in the karate club worked in opticians. She helped me find a way to find a way to, to fill that form in. <laughs> <laughs> it took sellers, come on. So then, so, whoa, whoa. so then I went to every boxing manager and trainer in Liverpool, and no one had given me a chance. He buzzed off me effectively. Yeah. Because the question is, well, how many fights have you had? <laughs> I've had about 200 karate fights. How many boxing fights have you had? No, I haven't had none. See you later. See you later. See you later. And then there was a lad working on the door with us who put me in touch with John Smith. John Smith ran. John Smith's still going today. Love John Smith for the opportunity he gave me, and I'll always be, I'll always be, um, I'll always be in love with the man for the time and dedication he gave me. But John ran a, a journeyman stable at the time. Don't know if he still does, but at the time it was a journeyman stable. That was that was what was on offer for me at the time. How old were you? I was late twenty-seven. Me, later year of twenty-seven. Was you still? Doing karate at this point, still training. Still yeah, I was. I've always been a, a competitor. Yeah, in, in any, I've always trained. I've always kept myself in tip top shape. So yeah, I know. I knew how to train. Look, but you kept body. plugging away, finding, trying to find a way into boxing. I was just a hard, hardened competitor. Yeah. And karate is if 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 you meet the right people is a hard competitive sport. But it's just it's just a different format. But um, but I I was I was. I was I was a tough competitor. I was, mm. a, I was I was a tough, capable individual as a fighter. Let's have this in context. I was a very capable fighter in my own way. And freestyle karate is a very fluid, beautiful art form. But I added a lot more impetus to it. 
I was very aggressive with it. That makes sense. Mm-hmm. So I became quite renowned on the circuit. And I'm quite feared the right word. I don't know because I don't want really to think like that. But I know how people reacted to me and, and, and they look worried when they were fighting me. So I had that sort of, what's the word when you got that? Aura. Aura. Yeah. I had that. Same aura as what Alfie and his, and his boys had in, in yeah. when I was looking up to him as a kid. You know what I mean? I, I took on that sort of aura. But it was a genuine thing. It wasn't wasn't put on. I was just good at what I did, and I was I was I wanted to win. So I took that into boxing. But so how did you how did you get in? So tell me the story. How you got in? What was the so John what was gave, the hustle? John, John gave me a, a tryout. <laughs> yeah. So the actual outfit I was. Then I had to go for a spar with some uh, ABA champion in Kirby named Darren Chubbs. For my first boxing proper boxing spar as a man. I sparred as a kid in the Everton Triangle. But John's test for me was to take me to Kirby. Told me in the ring with a heavyweight ABA champion, and obviously tell him fucking knock fuck out of him. I want to see, see what he's got. So I've never been in a boxing thing like that before, and I'm used to karate. Was it a rude that. awakening? Oh yes, yeah, very rude awakening. But 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 but, <laughs> but but I woke to it. Do you know what I mean? I knew I knew I had to prove myself. I was only 13 and a half stone. What was what was what was proving yourself be in that situation? It was just be able inside, to inside inside me. So I'm 13 and a half stone. This fella's 16. He's a big fella, and he knew how to box. ABA champions know how to box at, at that level. So he's hitting me with shots I've never been hit with before. In quick succession, because karate is a different style of getting it. Like you get kicked in the head, you, get, you know you're being kicked in the head, and, and you, you're gonna understand you're being kicked in the head. Because boxing's so fast and you, the so, um, the shots are coming in so, bah, 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 bah. and I'm, my head just going, bah, 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 bah. <laughs> and I'm thinking, what the fuck? I'm, I'm, you're getting stunned and, and and you don't know where you are, and then but at the same time you do know where you are. And you know I better I better fucking show what I'm worth here, mm. you know what I mean? And I did. Mm. So um, just snapped out of it because it was just it just. Well, I wouldn't say it was a shock. It was a shock. Make it sound like I'm not used to fighting because I was used to fighting. It was a shock. The difference between I've got a pair of boxing gloves on, I've got a fight in a certain way, I've got to fit a certain criteria of how to fight. I couldn't go into a karate stance that would look stupid. Yeah, it was is karate more of a, a kick led form? My kicks were my probably my best weapons, karate. Yeah. But what I'm trying to say is you go into a certain you go into a gym, Thai boxing gym, whatever gym, you've got yeah. to sort of fit into that mould, haven't you? Yeah. So if I would have started pulling karate moves off, I would have, I would have felt embarrassed. Yeah. And it just wouldn't have fitted the occasion. Yeah. Does that make sense? Totally, 100%. Yeah. So so did you have boxing moves down? No, I did you happen to hustle I, it? I took off. Look, again, and I'll be very, very clear, John was the person who gave me the chance and the opportunity, and he's the person that I've got a lot of love and, and loyalty in terms of, of, of inside. But I've got to be honest, at the same time, John didn't really teach me how to box. He was there every day. He was, lo- he was he was there, and he got me fit, and he got me strong. But we were fit and strong to go at a minute's notice, at a day's notice. I took that. We used to take fight a day, two days notice, three days. Do you understand what I mean? Mm-hmm. So it's not like you're getting looked after. The promoters aren't looking after you. The managers aren't looking after you. You're you're the cannon fodder to come in for the lads who they yeah. really want to see go to the top. That makes sense. Yeah. So our job was to, but I wanted to be a champion. I didn't want to just be kind of fodder. Do you understand? Yeah. I had a higher expectation than myself. But you go and these people who've been amateur fighters at high levels since. But I was proving myself in the gym over and over and over again with, with names that you'll know with a lot of people that have become famous through boxing since. So I'm thinking I can match this. But I was matching it not with boxing skill. I was matching it with tenacity and with toughness and with determination and with drive and with energy, do you know what I mean? Know what I, mean? I wasn't matching it with boxing skill. But <coughs> So for the six foot seven guy, <coughs> he's just like trying to stand there and have it with people. It works to a point. Yeah. But when you get to the fine tuning bits, you're leaving a lot of gaps in there. I used to block shots on me, head, basically. <laughs> I can take a good shot for the big tall fella. Mm. Yeah. So so I wasn't I wasn't getting schooled as a boxer in any way, shape or form. But after getting laughed out of people's offices and getting buzzed off and this, that, the other, within two and a half years, I was fighting live on Sky for the British and Commonwealth titles, ranked in the top ten boxers in Britain. Didn't have a clue off the box. 
So what was the secret of your success? What I've just explained before. Yeah. It's pure tenacity and will and drive and determination. Mm. And I had two jobs at the same time. So I gave myself credit. I'm very proud of myself. Tell for... us about that. Tell us about... Okay, so you understand your professional sporting ambitions during that period and you know, you're know moving into being a pro boxer, getting yourself some title fights. Where were you personally? Because I know you've had a tumultuous life. Right. <laughs> I was probably a mess, you know. I was probably, if I look back, I was probably just this. So, what are you, 28 at this point, 29? Yeah, I'm working in a homeless hostel, which was quite a tough. So, me- tell us about the homeless host- hostel. Let's just take a little detour here because that's one of the things that defines your story is your work with homeless people, but also your own experience of homelessness as well. And and even now, to some point, working with Lawrence Kenwright's homeless project i mean i think this is an important an important pivot point in your story tell us about that job how you got that job and you know what your experiences were at the you know the beginning 16 yts working, <laughs> working with a local city council which by god was like it was it was it was a, it was a it was a blessing to me because I was going. So he was, was a bureaucrat no, you, at sixteen. No, but you got to you got to you got to bear this in mind. I was a what do you call? Uh, I think they used to call it remedial class in school. Yeah, I was getting no guidance off anyone in any way, shape, or form. So are you someone ed- that needs ed- direction? Education? No, I wasn't that. I just needed guidance. I yeah. needed I needed family members or I needed someone to just guide me. Kids need, I guide my kids. I don't tell them what to do, but I guide them. I know what's potentially going to be beneficial to them, but I let them make their own choices and I, and I guide them. There's none of that in my life at any stage from anyone. Yeah. But that's not to detract from what I said earlier. I'm from an amazingly loving family, but they just had the, um, my particular family, because there's, there's, there's many of me extend the family you're going to achieve a lot of success and you were from the they were from the most hard hard areas of Liverpool but the guidance I mean mum and dad mightn't like me saying this but it's true I wasn't guided education took a took a terrible turn so I had one oppo- one shot I got from the career teacher was, was a was an application to Liverpool City Council <laughs> and the fella that met at the job interview was a bit of an, a nerdy type you know council officer type guy and he seen on my application form that I boxed. I boxed, I could put down a box that had a red triangle. And that conversation got me that job. Wow. Because his uncle was a boxer and he liked the fact that he had... Someone to talk about boxing. He had a link to some... Yeah. You know, he, he, the type of guy he was, I could tell he wanted to talk about being tough and stuff. Yeah. So that was... I know that for a fact that that was my... That was me getting the, the tick on the application. Yeah. So from that point then... We got options. What op- where do you want to go and work in the city council? And I chose homelessness at sixteen. I was, oh my god! Why did you choose no that? Way. Why did you think? You, why do you think you chose that? Because that's oh. it's quite an unusual choice to make, isn't it? Yeah, but no way, right? My first job was in Anfield Housing Aid, just down there. Yeah. Wow. This, this must be like a synchronicity, a synchronicity moment. Eh? Yeah. Wow. But yeah, they, why do you think you chose ho- uh, homelessness? Because it's I because from a kid I had a, I had a, um, when, when was what, this? What, this was what, it mid, late late eighties, mid nineties. Yeah, but I've always been I've always <coughs> been a protector of people since I was a kid. I was looked out for the kids who were getting bullied. I was looked out even if it meant I was going to get hard and for, for looking out for them. So what, what's that? What's that part of a person? Where, oh, not is it altruistic? altruistic, yeah. Empath- empathetic. Yeah, so you feel empathy for your fellow man, and you. I've just got them. a humanness about me that yeah. that extends to other people. Mm-hmm. That might even be saying I've just got something inside. I don't know where and it you're comes. You're tough. You, you know, you can. I wasn't you tough. Can... Ah, but I wasn't tough. Okay. Though. I'm so I'm, when I was a child, but right, I had okay. the same traits in me as a child as I have now. They're just more well understood now. Well, maybe I understood them better as a kid, and and, and they were just they were just beating out of me by life to a man. But they weren't because I, I've always, I've always, whatever that little spark in me is, that that does the good stuff. Yeah, it's it's pointing me in the right direction, and it's always been, it's always been there at the time when I've needed it to say no, when when that line could have been crossed, and many, many times to do many different things that people do when they want to survive. So, so, so do you think that 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 um, 
that part of your character, that part of your soul is what guided your hand when you chose this career path because it has been somewhat of a career path for you as well work, working yeah. in this field which is a really really unusual field um deeply so, involved as well yeah yeah because not only did have you helped people who've been homeless but you know to you're like a method actor <laughs> to really to really understand yeah, that, that's the homeless a small, that's a small small element of 20 odd years though. definitely but even so you, you've got that experience from a first hand mm. personal level which gives you even more empathy and even more understanding with the people that you work with so tell me you, you, you went for that job in the council and so start down for hours and eight down the road there, mm -hmm. and that was when what they call the bed it was called the bed city department so mm -hmm. you're talking men off the street the, the, the men with the real problem the, the, the pure alcoholics the men who've got no future other than a roof over their head and continuous at, the, at that time. Okay, so, so that's, that's, that's interesting that. So homelessness in the late 80s, early 90s mm. is different from the homelessness oh, yeah, today. Yeah. Vastly different. Because I remember, you remember the guy in Liverpool City Centre who used to play the cardboard guitar? Yeah. He was the old tram. So we had the first type of client group that I work with, that yeah. type of client group. Yeah. So so that was mm. more that was more of the type of, people who were homeless at that point, would you say that they had, um, you know, mental health problems? And no, that was just a particular area. Right? But So Anfield Housing, they catered for all homelessness. It was right, housing. Okay. So if you were homeless or you had housing problems, you'd come to Anfield Housing Aid or Granby Housing Aid, which I started working in a bit later. So you came to Anfield Housing Aid with your problem, whether that was full-blown homelessness, with your family, the place was just chocker every day. Um it was quite uh, uh, but yeah. desperate people looking for yeah. somewhere to live but I was good at it yeah and people, I had, I knew, even at that age of 16 I was good at in, I had to do reception <laughs> I had to do reception at 16 it was part <laughs> of your job I learned commun I learned how to communicate with other humans I, I was probably alright anyway but I just learned how to deal with like the most damaged people so it was a bit of a vocation for you would you say I think so yeah, yeah. It must be because I've, I've done some deep meaningful things with people who've been Deeply, deeply suffering. I had some horrendous experience. I mean, shocking, shocking. What but was, but what I stuck was, with it for twenty odd years, and I, and I didn't feel burnt out till the end. And again, this is this is crazy. But it was linked to a, a woman who was worked in the, in the female homeless service at the time, and something happened around the corner that I'm not even going to in, going to go into because it was so horrific. And it was the end for me. It was like, was this? Sorry, so have you jumped ahead of, the, of this? I'm getting to. I'm getting to the point. Um, well, I can't remember what your original question was. There, there isn't one really. We were just. We were just talking about. The, That's just the, coming the, to my mind. The then, general I nature speak of it, dealing with homelessness and homeless people, yeah, which so, is, it must be quite a, a traumatic experience. Dealing with these desperate people who've yeah. got not much going on in life, and you know, really at the bottom. The, 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 you know, and if they go any further, they go under, don't they completely, and they don't get back up. You know, so it's it must be a, a traumatic um, and um, difficult job. You know, did you, did you felt as if you'd had to become desensitized to, no, to a lot of I people's didn't. issues? That was that was me blessing. I didn't, and I loved it from for the most part. Mm. I loved that. I loved helping people. Mm. Just something in me that just responds to doing that type of work, right? And I done it well. The re I just got a bit emotional and I wasn't expecting that. So t tell us so, about that. So, so, so that's so what I'm trying to say to you is I got to I got to a 20 year stint of doing. I'm not long, maybe longer. 16 up until like yeah, late like 39, maybe 40. But the thing that stopped me doing it was what happened to some woman. Tell us. Here. No. Tell us in. No, 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 knock, no. The, the, hold back one, the details. One, 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 hold one, back the names. One, one it would um, to me it would. Um, It'd be disrespectful to her because she took her life after her because it was so it was so horrific what happened to her. Uh, I supported her the right the way to it. Because I was the I was the I was the staff on duty when she came into to the centre. And it and it like it's here, I mean also it's just trying to explain it to you. So oh <laughs> wasn't expecting this. Mm. But um just give me a minute. You all right? Yeah. It's deep. It's deep. See, people don't understand, do they? The, the trauma that you'd have to deal with when you're helping people. I, I wouldn't put it like that, but um, this, this, this was. 
Madness. Madness. But anyway, I put in for I've put in for redundancy after that. The offer was on the table and I thought, fuck this, I'm out of, I'm out of this job. Was maybe, maybe maybe it was uh, uh, me all along to, to a degree, a bit later on, but you don't think you realise what, what what you're dealing with. And it's, it, it, people don't realise that that world is a deep, traumatised, mm. dark, dark world at times. And look, in comparison to other parts of the world, we sit at the top table, yeah. Even mm-hmm. people on benefits here yeah. are doing well, but... Let's, let's, it's got to be relative to the the the, the society you live in, and it, it doesn't get worse for these people. And the shit and the shit and nastiness that goes on in that world. It's, by the way, to each other as well, not just the, you know, but they are victims because I don't believe, and I've no, I've thought about this deeply, and I've been there, and I understand it. No one wants to live that life. No, no one. That that's a life of suffering. So like. For you to be a stone cold drug addict, alcoholic, and some some have got all them problems, right? For you to live like that, is that to live in hell? Mm-hmm. But maybe that's their path. I really don't know because so I look at it that and think, why? Why would you? Why? Why of our souls have a choice? Would you? But maybe, maybe, maybe that is that is right. Maybe, maybe I've had to been been there to be taught something by them people. 100%. Did you ever f- try and find out wh- why they were in those situations? Yeah, I've, t- I've, I've look. I went just to work. I went to work and, and taking boxes. I, I was deeply involved. People went home to my houses. I took people home. The, the right people. Mm. Never took. I, I understood who I could t- who I could who I could help and who I couldn't. Talking teenagers, I've helped a lot of people get back on their feet. People who remember me to this day when when we, I'm still friends with some of them. So like lads in the lads who are taking the gym, introduce them to world in our fighters and and make them feel good. Mm. I was good at doing that because I wanted to see what I what I was doing it for in many ways was because that's what I wanted. Mm. That makes sense. Yeah, it does. Yeah. So they're the things I wanted as a, as a person in many ways, and I, and I, I'm probably trying to give what I felt like I lacked in in in, in the beginning. So. Uh, Lost me train of thought. Yeah, man. No, no, we're just talking about such a you know, it's not a uh, it's a heavy subject, isn't it? Yeah, but I didn't realise it was as heavy as it was until you've just asked me. Of course. <laughs> you know, we, 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 I'm sure that you one of them you one of them interviews that get people to cry. <laughs> <laughs> well, look into my Piers, eyes. Piers Morgan. <laughs> no, so so yeah, okay. So we know you went through this fan you know, this like experience with this job and Battling to be a title holder. What was going on in your personal life? Was you, know, you have kids at this point, and where was you at? So, twenty eight, twenty nine. I'm, I'm, Emily, no, Emily wasn't born, and she's me older. She's fourteen, so she was she was born when I was thirty. What age would I be in? Two thousand and six. Mid thirties. So. I fought for the world title on four days' notice. Who was the title? Why Amelie's mum was pregnant. Who was the title fight against? Some, some um, Hungarian dude up in Scotland. Took her on four days' notice. Taught it. Radaki. Yeah, man. That's yeah. Him. Taught me. Taught me ship had come in. But I, st- I was still. I still had the balls to take her on four days' notice. Right. Working night shifts and all that. That. But that's how I lived. I, I had to. I had to switch on. <coughs> I was fit all the time, because eh, the way John trained us, but. Just, I was just, 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 just driven, but driven. I wasn't driven in a, in a positive way. I was, I was, I was, I was, I was driven from lack. Would you say you're organised, like time management, organised? Because that seems like, you know, I'm, I'm, seems like it's, um, it requires a special type of discipline to be able to operate two jobs, run a relationship with a woman, mm-hmm. right? Um, and you know, time consuming they are, you know, and, and at the same time, manage a you know, a world title, ambitioned boxing career. How did you manage to juggle all those things? What were your tactics? So I'd work, I'd try and get on nights predominantly and work 12 hour night shifts, but you'd only have to do three or four to get your work and I was in a week. So that was, that was one of me, that was one of me little ways of doing it. And then I'd work a night shift, get a couple of hours sleep after the night shift in, in like the staff room. 
and then go to the gym, because the gym didn't start at 10 o'clock, but it's going to be finished at 7 or 8. You get an hour on your break, and then if you're lucky, you get another little hour or two, you know what I mean? But on average, two to three hours after or during the night shift, or a bit of both. It's like I take my break at the very end, and then and then sleep into my own time, if that makes sense. So doing that, go to the gym, get my training done, go home, sleep, um, get up, go for a run, go to work, repeat, repeat, repeat. So, did you like that though? Because I mean, I, I like that level of routine. Me sometimes. I didn't I, look. I did, and I didn't. <clears> and, and but I was doing it all from a place. I remember what I was doing it for. I was doing it from a place of lack. I was doing it from a place of being driven to to succeed from this kid who didn't want to live that life. That makes sense. Yeah. And it doesn't leave you, does it? Mm. And there's some very successful people I know, and 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 you'll. To be honest enough to say the same, it doesn't matter what level of luxury or material wealth you dis- you can achieve, if you're if you're not fulfilled in there, it all means nothing. And I've felt that feeling. I've done pretty good in my life at certain times. For a kid growing up in Kenny with nothing, I've done pretty well. But it was all based on hard torture, this work, hundred hour weeks for years. If you include the fighting. Um, level I had, to, I, had to com- I had to commit like a full time fighter I couldn't do it by half working on the door three nights a week doing the the, host- the hostel work and don't forget when I started getting money it's the first time I ever had money mm. so I'm, if I can earn a thousand pound a week for doing a hundred hours that was still a lot of money for me mm. ten pounds an hour job though you get what I mean so you're putting the like you're, you're giving your labour for that for that coin but it still felt like a lot. It still felt like success to me. Yeah, <clears throat> I was still able to buy a nice house and walk. I was still able to drive a nice car, go on luxury holiday. This was all new to me. You know what I mean? So a bit of a high point in your life, then, is it? Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, because I'm trying to explain. So, so, to you. So, I'm so trying so to explain to you the, that the material what, what, trappings didn't what I, give you. What the, I imagined yeah. was going to bring me it didn't. It didn't bring me fulfillment. Not it didn't, that. It didn't know. I was wasn't feeling happy. Yeah. Apart from like. You know, being time spent the time with kids. So why wasn't you happy? What what was missing? Do you think that you needed, or don't you know? Didn't know at that time. I know now. Yeah, I was just about becoming comfortable in my own skin and being. Yeah. The, see, like the person I was before I got into fighting is not the person I become while I was fighting. Mm. And I didn't become. I didn't become nasty or bullish, or I didn't become. I just. Che- I just wasn't. I didn't feel like me. Mm. Because you're surrounded by different people when you're a fighter, and if you're doing all right, and then people, will, I don't know, it just it just t- it just took me on a, a probably a direction in my life where I probably wouldn't have went if I hadn't found fighting. I probably would have been like that computer nerdy. I don't know what it would have been. I used to say what it would have been, mm. but fighting took me on a different trajectory that wasn't fully in essence with who I was as a human being. Does that make sense? Yeah. But a lot of fighters go down that route, by the way. Mm. So tell me about, okay, we've got a good idea now of where you were at. Tell me about the title fight. Which one? Is it the Peter Brodacci? The one that I got a world title shot for four days notice. Yeah, tell us about that. It was in 2009. I mean, it, yeah. okay. No, so, what, no, it wasn't 2000. So let's, it wasn't 2009. Can you remember all your fights? Mainly. Yeah. Mainly. Just a blur. Now, if you wanted me to go to, is it called a chronology? No, no, sorry, I don't mean it like that. I, I'm not asking you do to I, go to all your Do you remember getting in the ring? Do you remember getting hit? Do you remember? Yeah, the, I mean, have you still yeah, got... I remember. Have you still got full cognizance yeah, of... I think so, yeah. I, yeah. I believe I do, yeah. Yeah. I've only been knocked out in one professional fight, and don't forget I fought... I think how many, how many uh, boxing matches have I had? There's 16... Uh, 20, you know, so 24 boxing matches, professional... <laughs> 24, yeah. And how many MMA fights did they have? Nine. 17. Part, your boxing record in the 17 was part one. 117, lost six. Um, how many MMA fights did they have? Nine. That all they had, yeah? Lost. No, no, sorry. You won nine, lost six. So we had 15 MMA fights. Yeah, and squeezed then all them into two years. And then you'd had another four fights for your second round of boxing. Of boxing. So how many yeah. boxing matches did they have in total? 17, 20, 21. No, 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 more than that. No, 25 yeah 25 but yeah I've got a good good memory of like going to the venues what happened before the fight yeah. obviously so the Mark Hobson fight the British Commonwealth title fight which by the way to my absolute honour as a, as a two year boxer 
got one of the best fights of the year. Yeah, it was this Hobson. Hobson. Yeah. That was in 2004. He beat you, didn't he? Yes, what I'm saying to you is I'd only, I'd only been in a boxer for two years at that point. Yeah. And it, I, I honestly didn't know to box. Because you lost your first two and then you had a real win streak didn't Ten. you after that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then it was correct. a bit patchy after that. So, yeah. yeah. So that's when like, that's, I don't know, that's when you start questioning yourself and say, I don't know. A lot of, yeah, you do. A fighter, listen, fighters question themselves. I imagine you must do it all the it's time. It's like a raw thing being yeah. a fighter. So Tell like, me about getting knocked out. Um, how did that... How did your ego manage that? So the fight, fight with Option, what am I, like 30, been a competitor since the age of 12. 2004 it is, Hobson. So I've been put down once on the spa before that. That was the only time I'd ever been put on my ass. So getting knocked out clean live on Sky. Tell me about that, give us the build up. Well, I'm trying to, yeah. right, because I'm trying to think, I'm yeah. trying to remember if... Because I, I've I've got a great acceptance of stuff like that. I think I've been knocked out three times or four times. If you but it's not being in the gym. I've only ever been knocked out once in a contest, mm -hmm. and that was that, that was fight. Hobson. That was that fight, yeah. So being knocked out three times in gyms and all by top level world champions, by the way. But I've also given it to them. Yeah. So it is what it is. As a fighting man, I have to say that because of course. I'm proud of the fact yeah. that no one's ever. Oh, there's one fighter that I've mixed it with. I've hardly ever laid a glove on and I made that clear because it doesn't I want to be totally nutty like but the first time you get knocked out as a as a fighter that must be kind of a very mm. a very definitive moment in, in your career because mm. there's so much connected to that isn't there oh yeah a lot, yeah. Of, a lot of ego a lot of pride yeah but tell us can you remember the punch only by watching on the telly <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> but I'll tell you this when I watched it on the telly yeah. and when I stood up I'm mm. when I woke up, mm. I'm when I stood up, I'm when I, I'm when I, and, I, and I, I immediately respected the fact of what I just engaged in, yeah. and I immediately respected the fact that I just come because I nearly knocked them out just before that, by the way. Because there's a lot of fighters who can't handle it, can they? I mean, they don't come mm. back after that. They can't she, handle. She's not happened many times. They can't handle the psychological effect that has upon the, you know, the, mm. the self-image. It's, it's a deep thing. I yeah, can imagine it is. Yeah. That's that's been a manufactured thing mm. for, for fighters, and it's, it's really? unfair. Yeah. Mm. It, I put a, a, a video out years ago called Fighters Fear of the Knockout mm. I've seen it yeah. On, yeah so yeah. I think I explained it pretty eloquently you did that. yeah and I believe that to be true because if a fighter has to believe that getting knocked out spells the end of, of him as a not only as a fighter as of a man mm. do you understand what I mean it's a big mm. thing isn't it well, and this city this city I'd yeah. say was even more on that yeah when people get yeah but don't, rumors spread quick don't they yeah, but I think you're getting knocked out. And it's like they're not a man anymore if they're being knocked out. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's all hundred so percent. If you're yeah. a fighting man yeah. going through that potential uh, feeling. But yeah, all I can say about me, the day after, licked me war wounds, but I, I, I felt, I felt. Because on, on the subject of knock, knockout, I mean, Tyson Fury has now made, you know, being knocked out a thing, hasn't he? You know, against Wilder in the first fight. He didn't get knocked out. Well, he, he, got, he, he, he done, he he done the out. thing that all, <laughs> yeah, but he done the thing that all fighters would pray to do. Yeah. That, that, get a ref that counts longer than 10. <laughs> you know what I mean? To, 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 to go down like he did and get back up, that's like, that's, Incredible. that's a fighter's dream, man. No, but that's that's now defined him as a boxer, isn't it? In a sense that people go, wow, okay, not only this guy is tough, not only is he, you know, a great boxer, but he can, drag himself up from the lowest low and yeah but he did do that and yeah. not, not many people do drag themselves back up yeah that's so, do you understand what I mean totally yeah and, and, and the most unique one that you'll ever see that is, is with a fellow who died on a motorcycle not long after oh, what was his name Boxer yeah it's one of the it's one of the greatest fights of all time the it was he was oh, what was his name he was absolutely getting mullered. He was, he was just out. I think he went down three times and he got back up and knocked the other fellow out. Mm. And then he later died and he, like an Hispanic looking dude. And then he died on a motorcycle accident a little bit later on. I'll find that, I'll find the link for that one and show you the... Yeah. Um, I, yes, so, so, so that's interesting. So, okay, then Hobson was kind of... That was the end of your win streak, wasn't it? Yeah, so... So, but yeah, two losses, ten wins, Hobson. Yeah, and then it went a bit sketchy after that. Yeah, so so tell us about you know the whole period. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, tell us about the win streak. Who was your coach? What was you doing differently? Why do you think you was just on this hot streak? What did you found in yourself as a boxer that you were able to produce such consistency in your results? I'd have to say I wasn't a boxer. From what I've learned 
since then, yeah. the age of 40, I wouldn't say I was a boxer then. I was just a fighter who, who found a way to win. And what was your way? <sighs> I mean, it must be really hard to get probably, near you. Probably using more... Listen, I'm not discounting John's training, by the way, as well, because John had us like machines. We mm. were absolute machines in terms. So that goes a long way, you know. Mm. When you're able to, like, suffer, <laughs> and John made us mm. suffer. So, like... I found a way to use that level of fitness to me to me advantage. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, like so overwhelm people and just I can't ever say at that point my boxing skill was good because it wasn't. Mm. I, I was just I was just willing to just go for it mm. and going for it got me the win. Would you go the distance? Going for it with option near might have nearly got me because I did catch him and I nearly but his 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 boxing ability was so much greater than mine. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. So without me just going for it, which I did, because I knew I was I was up against it. So I just went for it. And I nearly paid off, but then I didn't. Mm. But still I got the respect for that, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. And that's probably how I've uh, conducted myself. You gotta bear in mind, you know, up until the age of forty, I would never I never had a coach who was my coach. So I went to martial arts school, so John coach coach is 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 his, te his team of fighters who you know we were mostly journeymen at the time there's a few like lads who come to who potentially going to go places but you need a coach who's correcting your your errors and, 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 and working to your advantages and benefits why and don't you think coach. you had a coach do you think, do you, no, think I had, you, do you think you're uncoachable possibly yeah and I've, I've questioned myself on that because by the time I got to Alfie's the coach in Anfield the karate coach Tommy he couldn't kick above his waist so he wasn't. He wasn't. He was just a tough man as well. Mm. But he went. I wasn't getting taught any um, technique. Mm. I learned by trial and error by observing others. So I observed the best, the best people in the club, and I'd try and imitate what they were doing. And I just carried on doing that. So by the time I got to Alfie, I probably thought I was already too tough to be taught. If that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. I probably weren't listening at that point because people feared me in a in a fighting ability sense. Mm. So maybe I didn't concentrate on the technical aspects as much as that what I should have. And then when I got to John's, John's what John wasn't really there to te teach people out of the box. John was there to prepare you to get ready for fight at short notice. And that's what he did. And that's what he come to the gym every day to do. Got love, you know what I mean? Mm. Gotta love him for that, because he was there, dedicated, getting us fit, ready and capable. But skill wise, there wasn't much time spent on that. But you had a good run there, didn't you? Ten wins. I mean, you must have been doing something right. I mean, it must have been. I can only allude to what I've just said. I just, I just were these points wins, knockouts. I mean, what bit was, of both, bit half of both. And half. But I didn't know to. As a boxer, I didn't know to. I had no blueprint of how to produce a knockout. If that makes sense. Yeah. I knock people out, and it's only looking back that I realise obviously everything, all the components come into place at that particular point for me to knock someone out. Mm. But I wasn't. I wasn't really taught how to punch from the correct position. So mm. I was punching like arm shots, karate style. Yeah. And on occasion, <coughs> it'd work and I'd knock people. So I had knockout power, but I didn't know how to replicate it. So that's mm. it. That's the best way. No, no fine tuning took <coughs> place with me until I was 40. Okay, so so let's move forward. It's 2007. It's your last boxing match. It's against Chris Bacon, which you lost. This yeah. is my first part of the boxing. First part, yeah, part one. <laughs> yeah, 2007. <laughs> so, what, what, what? Why did you decide that you'd reached the end of that particular part of the journey in boxing? You sure, you sure the um, the Does world the world title fight wasn't the last one, the first WBF one. Pretty sure it was. I, I don't know. I'm going off what your record is online. Where did you say that Jordi one was? Um, Hid, Hid Georgie Hidavi. So he's, he was 17th of the 3rd, 2006, and then you had one yeah. after that, caught with Chris Bacon. All right, okay, I get you. Yeah, but you know, you, you tell no, me. No, you're right there, yeah, you're all right. <laughs> but anyway, so let's go back to... That was, that was an area title fight, and I wanted titles, I was desperate for so titles. tell me about the Georgie Hadivi fight. That's the four-day notice world title one. Yeah. What do you want to know? So that's so you lost that one, and then you went into Chris Bacon, you yeah. lost that one, and then it seems as if... You'd run your course with boxing. So they were classed as, they were classed as stoppages, even though I wasn't knocked out. They were mm. classed as stoppages because you get hurt and you can't, you know what I mean. You get wobbly or you take a knee. And you can't. You stand up. You look a little bit, a little bit confused, whatever. So I was taking a lot of punishments as well. I was starting to take a lot of punishments. I got headaches and I was, me. That was what it was. My daughter was was either due to be born or was just born. I 
Ich denke, das war halt auch so ein Plain Damals mit dem mit 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 First Child, you know what I mean? Stuff like that, I remember thinking. So, did you retire at that point? I don't know. It wasn't like a, it wasn't a plan, it was just like. Yeah, that's what I mean. I was respectful to John and said thank you and said I was finishing boxing because my daughter had been born, probably taking too much damage. Mm. Um, and how old are you in 2007? Must be what? 30, 30 years. 13 years. 34? Yeah. That sounds right, yeah. Yeah. So. Um, and at this point, you didn't have any, any ambitions to move into MMA, did you? No, I'll tell you why I got into that in a minute. So okay then. So you've reached the you've reached the end of a cycle in your life here. First you? child's being born. Yeah. What was you working on? I was working in the homeless. Still yeah, in was the was homeless. Working on the doors and on the kickboxing club. Yeah. So I had enough on me plate to, to be cracking on with, you know what I mean? And a new and, and a new child. So yeah. I wanted to dedicate time to that to that. Was child. you feeling like your body was a bit battered and worn? Mm. I can't remember. Yeah. I feel better now than what I did 20, <laughs> 20 years ago. Years ago. <laughs> okay, then, so you, 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 you moved on from that. You came back as a fighter in an unusual decision. Yeah. You decided to go into the octagon and become an MMA fighter. So you've gone karate, boxing, MMA. MMA. So how did that come about and... and uh, Tell us about that story. So, after deciding I wasn't going to fight no more, I was just getting. I wanted to train. I'm, 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 I've been a competitor for like what two decades. I wanted to keep training my body. I wanted to stay fit, healthy, whatever. Still worked on the door, so I had to stay actively involved in some type of combat. I thought. Um. So Tony Quigley Senior was the boxing coach at the newly formed Wolf Slayer MMA Academy. And MMA had just sprung up out of nowhere and it, be, it become big overnight. And Bispin, Michael Bispin, yeah. was their marquee fighter because he just won the ultimate fighter. I was just watching an interview with him with uh, Joe Rogan. I think it's about a year old, is it? Something like that's really good. He's yeah. really good. I haven't really seen much of him before, mm. but he's got a... Good personality. He's good, he's good at selling himself. Yeah. That, that's part of his success, by the way. But anyway, um, and I want I want to give him credit because he, <laughs> he, he did he did well. But look, we got a lot of history, me and him. All oh, right, it? okay. So yeah. tell us about tell us about the history. Well, no, because it sounds like it sounds like sour grapes, and it's not because I'm not a sour grapes type of dude. I'm a, basically right. Did you fight him? So the first day I went to Wolfie, I put him on his ass twice. Okay. And from that minute on, he didn't like me. Yeah. But he pretended he liked me because I was useful to him. So hold on. So, 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 he, so he treated me like a friend, but he, but in, inside, he really he, he had this taste for me because he didn't like to be challenged, and I challenged him. Mm. So as a stand-up fighter, I challenged him greatly. As a ground fighter, I couldn't really offer a challenge at that time because I didn't know nothing about the ground game. But <clears throat> I wasn't really getting taken aside and getting shown how to deal with people on the ground. It's two different worlds, you know what I mean? Mm. Stand-up and in the ground, it's like... You're a, you're a stand-up fighter getting taken to the floor. You don't know what's going on. You're finished. That's a fact. I've got mm. no shame in admitting that. Mm. Because a grappler who is able to get hold of you and you don't know what, what to defend against, you've got no answer for it. Mm. You understand me? So yeah. I, don't care, I don't care how good your striking is. And I'm willing to admit that as a, as a, as a world-class striker. That doesn't matter how good your striking is if a grappler gets hold of you. So one-on-one, mano-on-mano, heavyweight wrestlers, to me, are the kings. Mm. One, you've got the weight, and two, you've got the, mm. the you know, wrestling's a tough sport. But they weren't wrestlers, so to speak, in the bus They were more <coughs> Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Yeah. It was a newly formed sport, so it wasn't really that. But the, but the bus was like. And that was Biz Ping's. That was Biz Ping's. Uh, he put. They, they, they put him on the map, but then he put. He's from Manchester, isn't he? <coughs> He's from Clitheroe. Clitheroe. All, all the small town fellas done better than all the big city fellas. Yeah. And I think that's down to like trying to prove yourself, you know what I mean? Yeah. Because a lot of the lads who come from a little small towns around Britain went on to do great things in in, um, in MMA. And all the scousers and Mancunians, we all thought they were the art boys. Mm. So I think there's something in that. But anyway, I'm detracting. So goes there, first day, puts it on Bispin, because he's trying to put it on me. I'm the new boy. Everyone's trying to put it on the new boy. You're the fresh meat, you know what I mean? Everyone's <laughs> trying to put it on you. So I quickly established myself as the as the boy to not have it with stand up. Yeah. <laughs> We're on the floor and just getting choked like a chicken. <laughs> but I can accept that because yeah. I know 
today's beginners tomorrow's you know yeah, what I mean yeah, you're you're there to learn yeah. yeah so yeah. I, I, I'm already accepting of all that mm. but at the same time I'm not getting no favours I'm not getting looked after Anthony and Lee who it great fellas but they had their eyes on the, on the prize and the prize was Bisping and shortly after them Quinton Rampage Jackson and, short, and with him Czech Congo they were team marquee USC fighters they were earning big money Rampage was a superstar at the time Bisping was on his way to being a superstar do you know what I mean <laughs> so you're surrounded by all that and again ding, if I can compete with these fellas and I was competing <laughs> harshly with them and he was in a stand up sense they, they, they so all that ambition came rushing back <laughs> to the world flood yeah. like, want to be a world champion UFC fighter I'm, now. That's what I'm, so I'm fight, I'm sparring the likes of these fellas who going on to fight for two and so I'm in their training camps they all want me in their training because I'm, I'm a very worthy sparring partner yeah. you understand me yeah. so I'm helping them prepare the, the they're, they're friendly to me because I'm giving them what they need you know what I mean they're not giving me nothing back other than the fact that I'm thinking I want to get an opportunity now mm. because of this because I'm proving I'm proving to everyone watching that I'm as good as these are you, are you adding your ground game to your striking game I'm slowly developing my ground game man. yeah so in my mind thinking I've only, got to, I've only got to get this ground game sorted and I want to terrorise these people but that was the only way they could beat me mm. they could only take me down they couldn't beat me on, on the feet but to know they wanted to but they couldn't was too, so my boxing stroke karate was perfectly magically matched for yeah. MMA yeah. Understand? and yeah. I used it to my best ability because that's what I see in, in watching UFC is that you know the, the, the strikers when they're punching they're, they're not boxers are they they haven't really got much going on the some of them have some yeah. of them have developed well. but look it, when, when you when you separate the sport and yeah. you put you know the champions of each you know it, it's, it, you're the champion in your own sport for a reason yeah and it, 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 MMA is, is evolving into this amazing hybrid sport, and it's, it's, it's the ultimate. It is the ultimate fighting um, style, isn't it? Mm. Nothing's, nothing's going to beat that. If you're, if you're a champion in MMA, you're a champion of fighting. Mm. You can cover every base, can't you? More so than not. <clears throat> um, so yeah, the cameras come in. The money was there. <laughs> I'm going to work and I almost off, I'm going to work and I almost off for getting spatter. Mm. Oh, I'm just being over the top there, but you know, that, that happened on occasion. But mm. dealing with like I'm thinking, I want that life. Yeah. That, this is this the life. I'm I'm going to that life. So I tried to go towards that life. I? But again, I had too many obstacles, too many hurdles, too many night shifts, too much too much stress, too much work. Um, how did you get your first opportunity as an MMA fighter? How did you get? How did you manage to get yourself, you know, in the group in order for you to get the fight? I mean, who because did it was a well managed. Both there was well managed by Anthony and Lee. Yeah, but I was I was in the bottom pile trying to work like like in football team. Yeah, but in the gym I was in the top. Does this make sense? Yeah, in the gym everyone knew that I had the ability to go to the top, mm. and that was a fact. But I didn't have the grappling ability to match me striking ability. And um, for me personally, when they had, they had a, um, an ex UFC heavyweight champion used to come over called Rico Rodriguez. I'm taking Rico around Liverpool and done seminars with him. Because when he come for the little two week blasts that he used to come over and get paid by the gym to coach us. I took to wrestling like a duck to water, probably because it was aggressive, probably because it was like a domination style of fighting. Mm. I, I struggled with BJJ. It was an art form that I couldn't, I couldn't get. I was going from being like this aggressive so stand-up were, fighter to, to trying to work off my back and do chokes, and it didn't work. It, just, it was Greco-Roman wrestling. Like wrestling, you, wrestling, yeah. and I took to wrestling. Yeah. But as time's moving on, it's getting later and later and later. But what I, what I always would have looked back on with hindsight and, if it would happen I've got no regrets now because again I've been to all those f f um, frustrations yeah. and sleepless nights of what could have been I've done I've genuinely done all that and I'm comfortable now um, but at the time I remember pacing up and down the house going up my fucking head you know what I mean so I just smashed the house up because of these missed opportunities that I felt like I was, I was getting <laughs> and I was just like I was thinking to myself why haven't you just sent me to America and, and just let me become a wrestler for six months with because I could, I'd, I'd, I'd just match anyone on determination mm. do you understand what yeah. I mean yeah. but on the final at the final push like if you, with a top wrestler they'll just they'll do you because they're a the top wrestler mm. 
that makes sense. Tell me about wrestling then, Sam, because there's something... It's an art form, but yeah. it's a brutal art form. Yeah, it's, it's about domination, like you're saying, isn't These it? These men are tough. Yeah. Wrestlers are tough. They're as tough as any striker, man. Yeah, it's like... Just in a different way. Yeah. <coughs> like, like wrestling and mahogany wardrobe. These men mentioned. are tough, man. Yeah. These men are, but, but I respect that. That's what I'm made of. I'm made mm. of that same, same metal. Uh, probably through the karate that, that formed the metal inside me that mm. is hard to break you know so you mean? had some good fights in MMA mm. yeah you had a decent record and then did you just see my first one in Liverpool yeah you seen it yeah knockout kick yeah yeah it's brilliant yeah. Well, that, that, so that's the night that you wanted and wanted. so that's, tell us about that night but I just, I'm just saying that's the night you want to capture and yeah. carry on and carry on because it's like it's like it's like orgasm yeah you know what I mean? <laughs> you still it's relive like, it every now and again it's like that's, that's, fl that's flow that's flow state yeah. that's, that's like the perfect yeah uh, that kick no it's not just the kick but it's the perfect um, what's the word I'm looking for Perfect performance, mm. you know, because you know you didn't. Because to get a performance like that, you got to go into flow. But I didn't again. The mind, the body, and the I've spirit. Only learned how to access, I could access if I could go back in time. I could access flow as an athlete. No, mm. then I couldn't. It either happened or it didn't. It happened with that fight. It happened with a fellow called Ben Smith. Like the flow state just became magical, and you know you're in it because like you feel like they've got the strength of ten men, the speed of hundred. You know what I mean? Mm. That's, <laughs> that's how you feel. I know the people who've experienced that will understand what I'm saying. Yeah. But the champions can reenact that. John Jones is the Mayweather's. They can, they can tap into that flow state. That will, I believe. That's what I believe. So, so you, you know, you're carving your way through um, MMA. You're hit getting some fights. Hit and miss, hit and miss, yeah, hit but and you're miss. still going through it, aren't you? And you're working your way towards your ambitions, um, training, getting stronger, getting better as a fighter, as a you know, an all-round competitor. What's going on in your personal life at this point? Ooh. probably struggling when I say struggling when do you it, become it, homeless yourself and let, let's get this clear I wasn't homeless on the streets at any and at any at any time mm. I don't want to make it sound like I was homeless on the streets and I was I had my cap out begging for money because it wasn't like that I always had somewhere to stay and I had so many how up. did it happen though how did you find yourself in that predicament <clears throat> because the 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 marriage was in fell apart for whatever reason. And it just, it just as, as things happen, mm. again, must have been meant to be. Um, and then obviously the man's the one that's... And I'm, and I'm a man's man. Yeah. I look after my kids first and I'll suffer for my kids. So you left. So I, I left and in my mind... I should I should have known it better, but I didn't. But in my mind, I'm thinking, my little, my kids, my little... I was gonna say, <laughs> my kids are used to this life. Got a nice house in Morton. They, they got a nice life. They weren't spoiled in it, but I wanted to maintain that life for them because mm. because the shock of leaving them and, and all that that goes with it. When you, it's it's you know it can be. It's, uh, I look back, it's not horrendous now in any way, shape, or form. But then I remember it was like it was it's like what you consider soul is saying. But the, the 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 reason. So I'm I'm trying to look after them. I'm 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 basically just giving all my money to the man. Cause it, one probably because of guilt or re, re, yeah. regret or whatever it was you don't know you got that many mixed emotions at that time but all I'm thinking is the kids come first the kids come first the kids come first so I couldn't afford in my mind to run another house I probably could have though mm. but what that's just like the self-sacrifice thing that was going through I, you yeah wasn't? so it's it's, it's like what, what did, did you feel what some did you guilt when you said keeping older all these religious people yeah. like themselves with yeah. The, yeah. I, was, I was giving me, I was giving myself a hard time wearing a hair shirt Oh yeah. yeah, but then I just went into like destructive mode in, in my own mind and my own heart. Not not against trying to destruct anyone else, by the way, destructing myself. So it all just all just unraveled. Things domino effect in it. Mm. Things just. But I maintain. I had this like gift of being able to maintain a life and go to work and do all the necessary things to provide for my kids. But I wasn't I wasn't looking after myself. I mean. I was just like, yeah, probably lost, probably just a bit lost. So you didn't have anywhere to live? Other, than, couch other than family members, yeah. friends and that. But then you start, you start putting your... But, um, oh, yeah, I just, found, I just found places to stay. Was it a difficult time? And homeless is defined by the fact that you have got no... Fix the boat. Fix the boat of your own. So, mm. you know, you, you didn't pay... So how did you find, how did you find the... Uh, the conflict or the juxtaposition of 
of getting up and going to work and dealing with homeless people, but at the same time not having your own roof above your head. Do, do you remember that? For the for a lot of years, and this was years that I chose to because I could have went and stayed in people's houses, but I started to feel like a bit. I started to feel like a burden. So I used to sleep in the lawn. <laughs> I used to, but it was listen. It was warm. warm. It was comfy. <laughs> you had all the bed. It was bad as what. Well. Yeah. But like, it was a guardian piece. You know what I mean? And when you tell <clears> when you tell that same thing, and I I shared this honestly. Do you know what I mean? I don't try and put a spin on it. Mm. And I shared it with the Guardian fella, but obviously papers, papers like the edit stuff and make it sound is a lot more dramatic. Do you know what I mean? But look, I'm sleeping. But that's out. a great piece in the Guardian. It is a good Does piece. Does you Listen, listen, I respect. I'm talking <coughs> about that, that particular one bit that I'm talking about the homeless, the mm-hmm. homeless bit. Because I chose willingly to go and sleep in that in that laundry room because it saved me at getting off for work and travelling. <laughs> yeah, okay. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, look, at the kitchen, a bit more to- time management. At the kitchen, at yeah. the toilet, yeah. and it was warm in the winter. Mm. I thought so. What? I'm not, I, I I was used to the um, I was used to sleeping in work anyway because what yeah. I said earlier. Cause when I finished night shifts, I'd sleep to, before I go to the gym. So it wasn't alien to me to do that. Mm. Do you understand what I mean? So yeah. So to me, it, it, the other aspect it was, the, it was being a part of my kids that that killed me mm. at first. You know what I mean, I've got I've got three more beautiful children now. So I've got five children. And I'm like, couldn't be happier. And they all get on. Life's working. You know what I mean? I'm not, I'm not painting a picture of like. That was just a bad period in my life, but we had to have these periods because I grew from it and I wouldn't change it. Mm. That was probably one of the most up. Well, it is now. If I look back, how I would have lifted me. What did you of, learn the most from that period? Would you say about yourself? How to, how to deal with um, how to deal with emotion mm. because I was I was raised in a family where emotions were never dealt with. So I learned how to deal with my emotions and my. Even victim, victimhood, just like probably in when where I grew up, was a lot of victimhood. And Kenny, a lot of what was me. You know what I mean, life hasn't seated you. Go people in the pub is just it was miserable at times. When I got to a certain age, when I got to a certain age, I started seeing it with different eyes. As it was as a kid, I remember as a kid it was nice. I got to a certain age, early teens, and so I just looked dark and decrepit and miserable. So. Uh, you'd probably take that into your adult, adulthood more than those blessed childhood years that, that, you, that you'd forget, that you start forgetting. So the longer it goes on, the more you forget, don't you? The more yeah. layers get put on you in life. And then, yeah, so... Um, so so you're, you're juggling all these these uh, life events, these emotional life events. Mm-hmm. Um, and then it ca- leads up to the defining MMA fight that... Ended your career. Tell us about that. There's a pre, there's a prequel to that bit though. Because okay. I'd been I'd been partying hard before that fight, and that fight. When you say partying hard, what do you mean? Because you're not a guy that like you know, going out and drinking a lot, yeah. a lot though. Yeah, and like staying out. For Is that an unusual blip? Yeah, because that I don't. Mean, I've never known you to. No, be that a weren't me at all. And yeah. people were shocked when you see me downtown partying. You know what I mean? And why was this? Was this connected to being just for something to do? Because oh, right, right. I was one for something to do, and two because I'd never experienced it that much. Because I've been so disciplined from the age of thirteen, mm. <clears throat> but I had a couple of years when I was eighteen, I think, that I experienced nightlife. But other than that, I was just, I was just straight across the T's, dot the eyes, kind of kind of fella who just done me training and looked after my family and then my family gets like what I considered at yeah. the time taken away from yeah. me and my head fell off so I just thought well if that's the life <laughs> that's what you could have won you know what I mean mm-hmm. I'm just going to go and live there I had a lot of people around me who lived that whatever yeah. you do whatever you want type of life you know what I mean like things are no option you know what I mean money's no option type of world you know what I mean yeah and these people like me and these people are my friends and these people had a different way of living that mm. I used to look at and think, well, <coughs> they seem to be happy. Mm. I don't know if they were. Like, go and have a go with that. You know what I mean? The excitement yeah. of it, all the, all, the, all the palaver, all the illusions that I see now. But it looked exciting at the time when I went with it. But I got too involved in it and things. T- just by just by mere uh, association, things can go wrong in your life. And, and, I've I've always kept my boundaries, I mean, but still things things that are always within your control. So I thought I've got to snap out of this, and that was the fight that I, that I proudly within five weeks got myself ready for. 
So that was me come back. That was that was me dragging myself out of me, mm. me little pit. And who was this against? Yeah, like called Ian Martel. He was a carbon fighter, and he was he was touted for the top. And he yeah. was, he was uh, so it was a big fight for me to take on a on the back of like partying half the year and after two years, five weeks training camp to then go in there. And I remember being in. in was the, you evenly matched? I. Do you know what I was? I was prepared to take any fight to, to drag yeah. myself out, and these promoters approached me, and it sounded like a good look. It was one of these look. I was either going to carry on where I was and just, and, and just continue unraveling my life, or take this opportunity. And I took the opportunity. I know he's a tough opportunity. He's a tough guy. Mm. He's from a great year. Um, so I knew I was up, but but it, does it make sense? I, yeah, yeah. Again, it go back to my childhood. I'm going down that, that route or that, that route. And that yeah. was the route. So fighting in my <clears> mind is saving me again. Yeah. My And I was willing to, to suffer whatever. Because well, you did, didn't you, as well? So there you go, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So go on, tell us tell us about this, the, the build-up to the fight and, you know, your, your preparations and walk us through it. Five weeks, six weeks. But it, but it, and I'm going from, like, basically walking out the pub into the gym. Was you feeling sharp at the end of it? By the end of it, yeah. yeah. I was mentally proud of myself yeah. at the end of it because because I didn't think I could one I could do it. I didn't think I could be fight ready in five weeks. So you left weeks. behind you left behind the, the <coughs> party and lifestyle. I literally walked out. Conditioned I, your body. I'll tell you the I'll tell you the truth again, right? And this this just sounds like total bullshit now because of so many t- things I've linked to this area. Mm. I was I was sitting on Breck Road. When I got a phone call off a promoter to offer me that fight, I was fucking nuts. Like. <laughs> Full circle. <laughs> a, few, a few times. <laughs> Keep going round in circles in Brown Breck Road. I don't even come from Breck Road. Yeah, yeah. It's weird, isn't it? Now you're out again. No, but I've got a lot of mates who live around here and yeah. I, used to, I used to party a lot on, in, in houses around here. Do you yeah, know what I mean? Yeah. But, um, so that's probably what the, the reason I would have been around there, but... I remember I'd been bevy. I know what I mean. I'd been bevy when I took that call for that fight, mm. and that—that's me having a bevy, thinking about the life I was living, and having this opportunity. I obviously didn't tell them I'd been partying on the phone, but here's an opportunity. Take it, and I took it. Mm. Like I took a fight on four days' notice. Like you know what I mean, I where just, was the fight? It was it was it in uh, in Blackpool. Blackpool. In a hotel, yeah. Yeah. Good crowd. Good good support. And what what camp were you in the Wolf's Lair at this point? I know I've moved to the. Um, Darren Morris is Jim and Adderton. Yeah. And John, is he the, the wrestling guy? Darren's, Darren, Darren's a coach, but he's a fighter. Yeah. Darren's a tough, tough man. He's one of them heavyweight grapplers. He's yeah. like the kings of the jungle type of fellas. He's, he's got it all done. He trains uh, Lee Chadwick now. Mm. He's the one who, who took Lee Chadwick from, from his career. Got really going nowhere. And he took Lee to, to, to Dizzy Height for Lee, do you know what I mean? Mm. He's, I think Lee's in Bama now, is he? Mm. No, not Bama, sorry. Bellator. And Lee's got a great... You want to interview Lee, he's got a great story. Mm. I wrote a great article about Lee in the past. Because um, it, it, it struck me what, what he'd been... I know, I know him well. He's a good mm. lad, Lee. But he's, um, he's a great, great story, Lee, for you. But anyway, so we'll get to there, yeah, and then I'm in the fight, and I, I get my skull fractured in the cage in the freak accident. Well, let's, let's get before we get there, because that fight's a good fight, and I, I felt as if you were, you were starting to... Uh, you know, you were starting to edge your head in that fight, and then all of a sudden it just goes a bit weird. And why well, have you watched the fight? Yeah, I wouldn't say I was edging it. I'd say it was pretty. I'd say it was just pretty even at that time. Yeah. He took me down, yeah. which is a big score, never mind. But I didn't feel, I wasn't feeling threatened at the time. Yeah, you can watch the fight; it looked pretty comfortable. Just, I'm trying to get back to my feet at that but point. But you don't. When 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 you realised there's something wrong, mm. yeah, did you know what was going on there? No, you, I've, I've watched. Listen, I've seen. I've seen the evidence because it's not on that fight you've seen. I've got uh, evidence that my mate took, which okay. I sent to solicitors and all that. I thought this is an open and shut case. But well, before we get to that point, that, that's so people who are listening and understand. Take us through in detail what happened to you in that fight at the end. I only know this by watching. Okay. The video that I've watched, obviously, numerous times. Yeah. So in the video, you see him at I'll take me down. Yeah. You see me. My back against the cage. I'm okay. trying to get back up. He's trying to keep me down. He wants to ground apart me. I want to get back to my feet to, to start striking again. Stand up striking. Unbeknownst to me, my right side of my skull is laying uh, across a metal uh, platform. 
and the, the photographers who take photos in MMA, they stand on platforms to take photos over the cage. But this guy had pushed the metal into the mesh. So it's mesh, isn't it? So the metal's pushed into the mesh and it, it's poking through the mesh. So my head, unbeknownst to me, laying on the metal, but you see on, again, this is no, this is not hearsay, this is what you see on the video. And then there's either been a gap between my head and the metal or my head's been resting on the metal and he ends up with that hard that. You hear my skull cracking on the video. You hear it? There's no, there's, again, there's no, there's no hearsay here. Did that. you know at the time? No, but then, then what you see is me looking very, very confused in the, in the cage. Yeah. Putting my arm up as if, like, Mark Goddard, the referee, the UFC referee, by the way, as if, as if he's going to attack me. I'm, I'm, I'm putting my hands up to defend myself against Mark Goddard, <laughs> right? So that, to me, spells mm. concussion, immediate mm. concussion. The pain was something I've never felt before. Sorry, that's a lie, that, because I, di I didn't feel the pain on the on the strike, because it probably because of adrenaline. But when Ian Martell hit me again, fuck me, it's like getting hit with a hammer. So, we, yeah, I... I after you've already cracked the skull. So my skull's cracked, unbeknownst to me. You see the fella moving the platform away, the photographer, after it's happened. Was he's realised, has he? Just, yeah, you just see him moving it away on, on, on film. I can show you the film. Um, the fight carries on. But, but he, Ian Martell's hitting me, and I feel like I'm getting hit with a lump on me. It was it, probably the first time in any fight I've ever felt afraid for my life. Mm. or fearful for my life whatever that whatever that thought was at the time I thought fuck me something bad's gone on to my head here and I knew something bad had happened by the pain because I, I must have a high pain threshold and this pain was excruciating but like not in a sick in a way mm. do you know what I mean and like, a, like, a, like a, your, your body knows your, body, your, your life's under threat type of way mm. that's what I felt like <coughs> survival mode and then he's carried on it, and me, my eyes closed. Mark got out, so trying to talk to me. He said, I can't even see you, Mark. You know what I mean? And he stopped the fight. Whatever he's saying, I just remember, I can't even see you. Stop the fight. Um, and then I, I come, I come after the shower, and I said, I, I know something's wrong. I, I know what's, and someone's telling me what's just happened. And I said, I can't believe that's just happened to me. You, someone witness it? Yeah, so everyone's telling me after the fight, after yeah. the mother shower. And my mate showed me in a video saying, that's what happened to you, lad. I'm like, wow. I'm trying to speak to the promoter, trying to speak to Mark Goddard, you know what I mean? They all just did, they all just want, didn't want nothing to do with it. Mm. You would be responsible for that, the safety of the fighters? The promoters? So in MMA, promoters are ten a penny at that stage. They're just yeah. setting up shows and trying to act like they be there day in a white, you know yeah. what I mean? So they're doing it without the proper insurance. Big old selling in Blackpool though. Um so anyway, when it got pursued, because they couldn't pin it on one individual. Yeah. There was no one's claim. Staying So what did you go to hospital and get X rayed and all that? Straight to hospital, X ray or CAT scan, whatever it was. Fractured down the side of me skull. Yeah, just lay in bed on my own, no one there thinking, fucking hell, what the fuck's going on here? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it was another. It was Should have stuck on the ale, mate. <laughs> it was another pivotal moment because I, I, I realised that I'd become stronger. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Because I remember lying, I, I was literally in the ward on my own as Blackpool Aussie. Yeah. Thinking, fucking hell, what's going on here? And then, um, but it, but, but, but it, but the experience previous, and just the mere fact, right, mm. that, that I had the balls to fucking do this fight, small, sure fight camp against this this lad who knew he was going to be a handful in public against in front of all mm. my mates. You know what I mean? As you do think all these things, mm. I had the balls to do, and I proud of myself, and that gave me that gave me strength. <laughs> I was back in work in the homeless hostel the day after. Did you feel though that it that's was how, that's how upbeat I felt? But did you feel that it was going to be a long road back to the ring or to the octagon? Did I you, didn't know did anything at that point, but I was no. on, I was on a high for two reasons. One, because of what I was just explained to you, mm. I was proud of myself, immensely proud of myself. And um, two, I survived. I respected the fact that I wasn't you no know, disabled or dead. Things like that back thing. I mean, I, yeah, I could have been lying on the on the jagged on the corner because it was, it was yeah, right. That corner, yeah, it, was a, it was a metal it caved platform, in, couldn't it? So that wouldn't have been pretty. Mm. But um, 
So yeah, I was, I was, I was in a, I was in a ref, happily reflective, positive mood as, as, as mad as the team. Mm. Um, and and I was back and I was back and worked it there after because I felt like I felt I felt honoured by, by myself a little bit. I felt strong and honour, honourable. How did you recover from a fractured skull? But I thought my fight career was over. Yeah. But to, but for for the feeling of compensation of that of that, I thought this is an open and shut case. My fight career might be open, but it's an open and shut case because mm. because of, of the video, because of what I've explained. You can see it. You can hear it. It's, it was like. He's gonna argue with this, mm. you know what I mean? But um, they did argue. Yeah, <laughs> nah, they got away with it. So, so that was a bit of pill to swallow, wasn't it? Yeah. At the time, well, I remember it would be again. No, now it doesn't feel like. Did that. you have a lot of resentment for the, the people who were meant to be blasted? Yeah. Blasted that everywhere, all did over you? social. Yeah, <laughs> I did never, I never left, never left them alone. To be honest with you, really. But um, what can you do? Mm. Do you, do you, do you, do you, do you just, they, just didn't, they didn't have any money. They had nothing to offer me. Did you lose your license then? Your ability didn't to fight. Didn't have license in MMA. No, not in UK MMA. Yeah, that's, that's so. What it. stopped you getting back in the ring? The, the so, the th so the things that allowed them to go without getting insurance so are probably the things that allow fighters to fight under, yeah. under dangerous conditions. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? But it, it looked like a good show. It had a good old sell. Had a referee like Mark Goddard on there. He's mm -hmm. well renowned UFC referee. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. So. um like I'm a bastard, you wanted to go back into the ring after all of uh, everything that you'd been through. But this time, you found yourself a coach, which what I feel is if it's one of the things that you'd been lacking or needing previously. So tell us about tell us about that. So Fran Arden was a man who we knew anyway from back in the day. He used to work the doors together. And Fran was a top-level fighter himself as a boxer. Not only was he top-level, he went on to learn from... The top coaches in Britain travelled all around Britain. He was he was high end, Fran as a boxer. He was going places. He, he'd have to say the reason why his career didn't his career, but he he, he finished a, a, I think a, a ten fight unbeaten pro. But he was he was standout amateur as his, as was his brother. Um, so the Ardens were a well known family, Liverpool boxing family. The dad Billy as well. So Fran, he had a different way of approaching coaching. And there's a way that worked for me. So, explain to him, I think, if I can remember right, that I wanted to just have another go. I wanted to, you know. So, tell me about that, though. So, why? Yeah. So, d d dig deep here. What was, the, what was the thing in you, right, that thought at that age? Because I was partying again. <laughs> you needed to get off the yeah. ale again. So that was my that was my that was my <laughs> life belt. Hell, yeah. with my li I was only fighting with my life belt, so I needed to get out of these new habits that were forming. The yeah. Thinking habits, the going out. But habits. was you thinking in terms of like you just wanted to train, or was you thinking actually no? I, I wanted fight to again. no. I wanted to compete because did they want to compete? Probably. I just wanted to be back in the gym doing. What made me disciplined? Would you would you say you're addicted to fighting? No, it's because it's because I probably knew throughout my life that the discipline that went with the fighting. By the way, the mm. discipline. So when I switched on with the discipline, my life worked. Yeah, get it. Yeah, because it was discipline. Yeah, I ate right. I live right. So when, right. whenever you went doing that, it my life my life apart. connected. My life connected to yeah to the discipline of combat. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So when I had fight camps, I was I was at my best in fight camps because I was completely and utterly one track minded, mm. and I was I was able to. I'm a disciplined man when I want to be, but that that's become later. I can do that now because of that in the past. But at the time, it was discipline for the fight camp, and then just do what you want after that. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Mm. So the discipline used to go after the fight camp was over. Yeah. I maybe being a bit harsh with myself there because I wasn't, you know, it wasn't, a, it wasn't wild in terms of the way I ate and the way I always looked after myself pretty much, but I was yeah. ultra disciplined and I liked that feeling mm. of being ultra disciplined. So it was that I think mm. that they have my eye on a another title or a, a, what what come after that with the op the Roy job probably not, but I made them opportunities happen for myself. So, so when did the the title fight the WBF? That come on. That probably come on the back of the, the fight I was meant to have with Roy Jones. Oh really? So 
Um, that got me a lot of press, didn't it? Got me a lot of. I thought it was the other way around. I thought no, that came as a result no. of uh, of uh, Roy Jones. The Roy Jones opportunity come up. So, Dob, before we raise ahead to that, because that's an interesting story in itself. So, yeah. so Frana turns up. Does he tell you that you can fight again, or do you approach him and and say, Franny, help, help me out of this and <laughs> get me in the ring? <laughs> <laughs> it was sort of along them lines of just kind of come and say in your gym because and it, you've and gone karate, to... you've boxing. MMA, MMA back to boxing. boxing. Yeah. Because yeah. yeah, So I go to Franny's gym. Yeah. And I've known Franny's a friend, but I haven't known him as a coach. Okay. So I go to the gym to train. And he starts picking up and pointing things out to me that that I'm doing incorrectly. And I start seeing the benefits of his coaching. I start realising how, how much depth he's got as a coach. Yeah, Franny's a deep man in his own in his own way, but he's but, it, but as a coach as well, he's got a lot of depth to him and a lot of understanding and a lot of... He's meticulous. Is this something I, like that, I like that. So again, it's something I've never experienced. Is this something that you feel as if you... I would uh, be lacking. So yeah. I'm thinking, I'm 40 now, but here's a, co- here's a man who knows how to coach. coach me. And it will connect him. <laughs> and you know, the yeah. fighter and the coach have got to connect and we did connect. Was you feeling 40? No. No. I don't feel, that, that, that's a better son of the blessing of mine. I've never felt yeah. any age, you know what I mean? I just blank it. <laughs> just blank it. Certain things are good, I just blank it. Mm. But for, for, for me benefit rather than me detriment. Mm. Me. So, um, so I'm getting these f- new feelings of like engagement with uh, with a person who I'm thinking, he can, he can be the difference between me not realising this dream because I still haven't given up on my dream when I'm starting to get these feelings. <laughs> I'm starting to get these feelings. <laughs> Coming back all over again. Yeah. He's rekindling my dream, you know what I mean? I'm that thinking, moment with the compass on the table yeah, is still there, serious, isn't it? It's still yeah. burning I, I away. I think like that. I yeah. think I'm, I'm pretty deep like that. Mm. I think things are all, all happen for a reason. So I'm thinking like that. I'm just putting on my own little pieces of jigsaw in place. Coming up with my own, own belief system on it. And yeah, that's what I felt like. I started feeling like this was meant to be again. So when a man I haven't seen for years. And was back. he up for it as well? Or did you have to persuade him? I think I think with every in terms of the boxing side, because I wasn't I wasn't a, a, a what you call it, I didn't have a pedigree as a boxer. Mm. I had a pedigree as a fighter, mm. not as a boxer. That's different, isn't it? So I suppose um proving yourself as is a is a great part of it. I have to prove myself in in the boxing world to the coaches, <coughs> and I prove that through hard work, discipline, um, and all the things I mentioned before: tenacity, just willingness mm. to to just do what's needed in order to um, to develop and to and to grow. So I think I proved myself too, and then the Roy Jones opportunity come but up. But you had a couple of fights before Roy Jones, didn't you? you had, only, I think I only had one or two. I think, you know, I think there's about, it was about three fights or two fights before Roy Might Jones. Been, yeah, yeah. Uh, so you were you were back in the ring. Yeah, you were back competing, in the ring winning. Yeah. So tell us about that amazing little anomaly that came into the you know your your sphere that you know you could have been. Fighting Roy Jones Jr. <laughs> well, I don't, well, I don't know. <laughs> totally mad. I mean, so that's when we kind of met at that period, I think. No, we've known each other for nearly 10 years. I oh, think. really? Is I pulled yeah. back further than that? Right, yeah. okay. Yeah, so, so I, so met, I yeah. remember that was a real, real positive thing for you at that yeah. time. Yeah, it was brilliant. It was and really, life really good. wasn't still going to plan at that point. But it's, it's funny, isn't it? We're talking about Roy Jones Jr. It's like, you know, he's now um, lined up to fight yeah. Tyson. Yeah, Mike Tyson's comeback, and and you've also got a connection to Tyson yourself, haven't you? You met Mike well, Tyson. Well, yeah, you, you met him. You got a picture. No, you got a picture of you and no, him. It's a good. He's listen, holding your baby, listen, isn't it's he? Go, go, <laughs> it's a story that it doesn't a lot get of, more personal than that. No, but it's a story that a lot of people may have sort of had with him because he's he's met he's met a lot of people, and spe- even Liverpool Tyson. Like, after Devonshire. Yeah, but here's here's the little here's the little twist to this tale. On the lads. Excuse me. <coughs> One of the lads who runs, at, well, I don't know if he still does, but he did at the time, luxury tour buses. One of the ones with that, yeah. like a, like a, um, what they have for the, the bands and stuff, they got bedrooms, yeah. on, they, got, they got everything on, luxury, luxury tour buses. And he ended up getting the contract to take Tyson around the country. So my son Jude was six months, eight months. So we're talking eight years ago and Tyson was coming back to Devonshire 
and the lad who had the tour buses because he's he's driving them round and be, and he, he knows his manager the tour manager and obviously knows him because him and his family are on the bus. He he lines it up for me and another mate Tony plus my son Jude and Tony's son to have a private meet with Tyson <laughs> in the green the green room, no green room in the back of the Devonshire. But at the back of the Devonshire, get there a bit early, half an hour earlier, and you can get to meet Tyson, get a photo with him and all that. So before I go, I drive the Asda. I get a one. This is on the faulties as well, <laughs> all over. Get a get a one pound gift bag from Asda. Fills it with sweets and chocolates because I knew his missus and kids were on the bus because my mate told me. And honest, honest to God, right? This was this was done with a genuine heart, right? <laughs> and he was kept missus and kids on the bus. Respecting. Goes to the green. Now when he walks in, he couldn't be asked. I sw- he just couldn't be asked. I mean, he didn't even look me in the eyes. He got introduced to me. The tour manager knew me from the MMA world and mm-hmm. introduced me. Go, oh, Mike, this is Tony, my boy. Because he knew me personally from the fighting. But Mike Tyson just couldn't be asked. I mean, a lot smaller than me. Stuck his hand out to mm-hmm. shake my hand without looking, looking at me. And as he stuck his hand out, I put the gift bag in his hand. Did you have your glasses on? <laughs> did you have your glasses on? You must have been able to see it anyway. <laughs> so I, don't down there. I don't think I did on the phone. Yeah. But as he put his hand, I put the gift bag in his hand. I said, Mike, okay. that's for your kids and your missus who know we're on the bus. Respect from one fighter to another. Yeah. I, this is what happened, right? He's shaking my hand, not even looking at me. Takes the gift bag in his hand. Looks at the gift bag. I see him like just stop and look at it. Looks up at me. Looks back at the gift bag. Looks up at me again. And he's looking at me, I would say, with, with very surprised eyes. Yeah. And then he become animated. Yeah, so you cracked him. I don't know what happened, but yeah. I seen this man, not asked. Yeah. Met a million people in his you life. Give him a bag of sweets. Who just, want, who just <laughs> wants shit off him and fall to you there. Yeah. But I, I just showed him genuine respect. Yeah. And that, But he became a different character. Mm. Arm and army to the I bush. love him. He's an amazing guy. Yeah. Got loads of but so yeah. I took him from a position of like total and utter coma to a state that he looked like he was in. Yeah, he snapped him out of it. I did. Yeah. I'm proud of that moment. And that, that photo is that photo you've got is just fantastic photo of you and uh, me, uh, me son. You him and your son. Let me it, take as many photos it, it, as it looks like he's he looks the happy. He lo- it looks no, it looks like it looks like he's the godfather and your son's christening. <laughs> I've seen him, the, I've seen him <laughs> holding the bag. Yeah, it's brilliant. <laughs> it must, all I'm saying is right. The human condition. All people want is something from him. Mm. I the first thing I done was give him something. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Yeah. Can I have a drink of my drink? Of course you can't help yourself. Look unprofessional. No, it's just, it's just two guys having a chat. So it's, it's quite a, quite an unusual story. And another fella who's very unusual who I've been in to see a few times in prison, Charlie Bronson. Okay. So tell me, let me tell you this. So how do you know Charles Bronson? <laughs> Again, through the fighting. Yeah. Just a mad little story of meeting his mate at a, at a book launch. I was in this book called Mersey Fighters. And it, and uh, one of Bronson's best mate come to the book launch because he was a, a boxing Anorak, John, lovely fella, John. And then a year or two later, he's put me in touch with Bronson. Bronson had seen me British co- Commonwealth title fight with Obson and told John to tell me that a fight with the art of a line and he respected me. And that was it. That's wow. how our communication started. Sent him a copy of the book. And it just so happens that Tyson, on that trip, I drove to, to uh, Charlie Bronson's Mars house in Wales or this could have been a tip before, but this is a fact, with one of his world title belts. So, and so present, t- presented it to Charlie Bronson's mum. Wow. And as a sign of respect to Bronson, because he couldn't go in to see him because the authorities wouldn't allow him to go so in. So he was a fan of Charles Bronson? Basically. Yeah. They're a fan of each other, I think. Yeah. So you then developed a, like a, a pen pal relationship with but Charles But isn't that Bronson? like a Forrest Gump type yeah. of story? Yeah, all linked together. No, I went in to see him a few times in Wakefield. Yeah. And do you know what? He's not a he's not an evil man. He hasn't really done nothing evil at all. He's never killed anyone. Never killed anyone. He's never he's never been uh, damaged a child or a woman. Mm. He's a fighting man. He's mm. just he's just a menace to the system. But he's not an evil man. Mm. He's a man you'd have round your family. Do you, you think he'd mean? ever he'll ever get released? I don't know. I hope he does. Cause it's it's like having, it's like seeing a caged cage bird when you go meet him. Mm. He's just a character. Mm. Has he still got his, his soul? 
he's a, he's a, what's it, is the word gregarious? When yeah, you, talkative. He's, he's just like, yeah, he's, he's just like, I don't know. That's a fuck. Imagine interviewing him. Wow. Mm. I mean, I've sat with him for two or three hours at a time, been to see him all five times. When was the last time you went to see him? It was a while back. He was, he, I think he fell out with John and um, a few of his family. And I got pretty pretty close to some his brothers and that. But like a few t- strange things went on and I just don't know. I mean, I'm, not there to, I'm not there to be a sicker fan. I'm there to... Of course. I mean, he's a unique character, isn't he, in, in yeah. British history? I, and he's, he's going to be remembered for whatever he does. But I can't see how the, they can release him because they've created Frankenstein's monster, haven't they? The system has created... He's a menace to society. Yeah, yeah. Uh, sorry, they see him as a menace to society. He's, he's a menace not, to them. He's a menace to the system. Yeah, and they've created them Because when he went in, he was just a normal guy, wasn't he? Or, you know, not a normal guy, but... You know, he wasn't this uh, character that he is today, Charles Bronson. To, to me, he's the epitome of a man. And I'll tell you the reason why I'm saying that. Forget all the criminality aspects that you want to attach to him. He's gone into prison in his mid early 20s. And he's, this is what he said to me. He said, I was not prepared to be bullied by either man or mm. screw. Mm. And he said, I went in with that mindset that no one is going to take from me, bully me, harm me or whatever. And that was his mindset. And he stuck to it for this long, for forty years. <laughs> he's been in so his mind, he's thought, "I'm not, I'm not bowing." Or yeah, think of what he says. I'm not lowering my eyes to any man. Now, but back in the in the day, he went in. The prison officers, I don't call them screws. Call them prison officers. Call them screws. Do you know what I mean? But these people um, ran the ran the prison, didn't mm. they? And they were probably brutal at that time. Yeah. Don't the like today because I've never been in prison, mm. but I can imagine at them times he was brutal. Mm. So like he was, he was getting a lot, of, he was getting a lot of abuse, no doubt, mm. for standing up. I mean, yeah. So that's interesting, isn't it? That Mike Tyson has got a connection to Charles Bronson. You've got a connection to Charles Bronson. Six degrees of separation. And then we we go back to Roy Jones. Right, where this oh, yeah. conversation started. It's Boston Christie. Right, is uh, you get an opportunity to fight Roy Jones Jr. in an exhibition match based in Liverpool. How the hell did that it come about? Wasn't up? an exhibition match, you know. Oh, is it just a normal fight? It's for the title, yeah. Okay, what title? Some, some jag one, but yeah. I don't care. It was a title fight in Roy Jones. Yeah. I was happy to take it. So, how the hell did that come about? And how did you find yourself in the position of being the challenger? Tony Dodson was meant to fight him. He brought him over. It was um, the Vaughan the Vaughan family brought him over. Oh, I don't know if they got the connection with him. Look, at the end of the day, he was just out to fight for money. Yeah, of course. He was, he, going around. He was so, skint money. He got to have been. To him, it was exhibition fighting. To me, yeah. I just wanted to fight a legend. I considered him a legend of the, of the boxing world. Yeah, and he is, you know, he's a, he, but why has he achieved? He is a legend yeah, of the boxing yeah, world. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah. to fight a legend of the boxing world, why, totally. why would you not want to do that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, went to the press conference with him in the beer keller. With him? Yeah, turned up. Yeah. Cool, yeah. Beer keller, press conference. Big moment for me, you know what I mean? Yeah. As a fighter. Of course. But as I, as I, as I explained in my first words at the press conference, I respect him greatly, but I'm not here to... I'm not here to um, I think I said, in terms of the respect they have for him as a boxer, I respect myself as a fighter. I'm not here just to be. Yeah. How do you find all? I that? wasn't there just to make numbers up. How do you find the trash talk you've got to do as a, as a boxer? I've never done it. Opponent, no. Nah, do you I've think? Do you, do you think you might, you personally, might show too much respect to your opponents? It doesn't matter. That's who I am. I'm a respectful man. Yeah. But I don't. No one really. No one's ever really trash talk me. Not that I can remember. No. I don't think anyone's ever said it. It's a good way to be, in my opinion. Mm. But anyway, um, I was just there to turn up as a fighter. I'm yeah. a fighting man, and I knew I'd put a fight up, no matter what. Rain or shine, with my shield or on it, I was there to have a fight, and I would have had a fight. And I trained hard for that fight. Because I was, I, was, I was hungry to beat him. He yeah, wasn't man. hungry to beat me. Of course, yeah. So, but as a boxer, I couldn't, I couldn't compare to him. But as a fighter, I can compare to him all day long, do you know what I mean? As a fighting man, mm. with no, you know, in, 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 with another set, it doesn't matter. But as a fighting man, I can compare to anyone I've mixed it with. Mm. So what happened? He pulled out the week before the fight. 
It must have been a really oh. painful experience for nah, you, that means. Nah, we should say then. Just oh. took me kids to the street to show them where daddy was fighting the oh, week after. God. Oh, bah, bah, bah. That same night, kids put the kids to bed. Phone call. Who from? Promoter? Um, Stephen Vaughan. Killer. That was a killer night. But again, no, sucked it up. Went training the next day. So tell me more about it. I mean, why did he? Why did he cancel? In your, he didn't give a reason. He just said fuck it. So it was either black from the beginning. Yeah. But he turned up in Liverpool. Or, um, how did that make you feel? Or like? what he heard was he was, in, he was in Russia mixing with the billionaires, and he basically what, what's going to Liverpool to fight for the gang will be better. Poached them. Just stay here, lad, and we'll look after you. Yeah. But my my. My thing with him was that you haven't acted like a man there or a champion. You're meant to be a man and a champion. You don't do that to another man. No matter mm. how dismissive you are of him. Mm. Make it right, don't you? Mm. Could have made it right with a pair. Could have made it right by paying. Whatever. Could have made it right. Could have made some type of token gesture. Say, this lad's just given nine weeks of his life up here. Could have done something. I could have done something proper. Was you feeling good? Oh, f- f- physically, yeah, yeah. I've run up mountains every day. <laughs> oh, no. Like a Rocky film. <laughs> but look, that's always my only thing with him was he didn't laugh proper. He didn't laugh like a man. Give a fuck how how I up to the level you think you are. No better a man than me. In fact, you're a lesser man than me. Because I wouldn't treat other people like that. But the silver cloud. Just because you're famous or whatever, it doesn't give you no right to see people with disrespect. No, you no. Know what I mean? yeah. That's my old philosophy on life. Mm. So fuck him. Mm. Hope you got his head face, his face mask then. By <laughs> That's what I was gonna ask you. That's who you gonna support in that yeah, fight? You know <laughs> like that. I haven't even got no sour grapes towards him, you know, because again, he taught me something. It was a, a life lesson that I, that I, that I am. Not just that. It led, it led it, the silver lining to that particular cloud. Is that it led to the title fight? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But t- you know, yeah, it did. Yeah. Well, yeah, it did. Probably, yeah, probably did. That. That was like an advertisement for me, wasn't it? Yeah. To get me a little bit. Yeah. A bit of a... Um, yeah, right there. So I thought of it like that. Yeah, man. So, so so what happened after that? Where did you go next? Because, you that know... was August, was it? How did you get the Rob fight? Tell us about the Sandy Rob fight. I got contacted by a Scottish promoter and said, you fill my stadium and I'll give you this fight. I said, no problem. Amazing. But I didn't fill the stadium. <laughs> you know but you got the was. fight. <laughs> no. It, I'm sure it was. Um, it was in Paisley, wasn't it? it? Yeah, but it was. It was some. I'm sure I've been in the cup final or something or Liverpool. Mm. Some major team, or it could have been Everton and Liverpool. Did Everton Liverpool play for the title a few years back? No. One of them was at Wembley anyway. Yeah. And I had like bus loads of people going, mostly mostly blues. I think they were. And they all just bailed on me. What, last minute. I wasn't asked about them not coming to see me fight. I was asked about <laughs> how, it effect- the no, that's how badly it affected my purse. Mm. My purse was based on me taking people. Mm. A lot of people were going. And a lot of people. What did you up. get paid for that? I'm embarrassed to say. Because yeah. everyone thinks world title fights, you're going to get crazy money. And it was probably one of the worst pay packets I've ever had for fighting. For, for something at that level of 12 rounds, it was mm. terrible. I took it anyway. Well, wanted, tell us about the. Tell I wanted us, the title. Yeah, no, it's great. It's great. It's a great ending. It's a great That's end. I mean, it's yeah. a great ending to, you know, a career that has had lots of highs, some lows. Yeah, and about how you've dealt with each of them, and you've kept going, and you've kept going, and you've kept going, and like forty-two, right? Forty-two is you get a world title shot, a world title boxing shot against Sandy Robb in Scotland, and. You know, tell us about that fight. Fran had saved me with absolute perfection for it. Probably felt the best I've ever felt as a, as a com- combative athlete because of the way he trained me, mm. the way he prepared me. It did, was meticulous. Did you know who you, Did you know much about Sandy Rob? Uh, yeah, he was, I think he was a decent fight. I think he was a, a Scottish champion. I think he fought abroad, younger than me. Tough, he was a tough, tough cat, him. Mm. But... Um, but, uh, but I'd also found me health let me late 30s to a fellow called Clive the Carl and a lot of research and a lot of detailed understanding of myself that I learned to a lot of arduous time and effort to learn about the body and stuff so it's like a, like a little, little magical moment for me of all things coming together mm. my health felt brand new as a person 
partner. Um, life was just coming together again after a, f- a few rocky years, you know what I mean? Mm. So I was feeling good. And it was a, it was a, way, it was a way to repay me for me, in the, personally. Yeah. Not for anyone else, you know what I mean? It ends up, it ends up very personal in the end. Mm. Um, you think you're the, you think you're pleasing others and, and impressing others, but you know you're just doing it, you're doing it all for yourself. But the fight itself, I mean, you bossed that fight. You bossed that fight. Twelve rounds in Scotland. Yeah, yeah. no, no, you bossed it. I'm, I'm, oh I'm, yeah, yeah. I watched the fight and it was a shutout. It was a total shutout. Yeah, and you just couldn't, you just couldn't get near you, could he? Twelve rounds, twelve rounds of forty-two yeah. non-stop ra- it, rounds. Pretty, pretty it, impressive. It was brilliant. Yeah, I mean, yeah. you just controlled him with your jab more than anything, right? And you just couldn't get it. There was probably. Halfway through the fight, you tired a little bit. And Men- he f- mentally, I tired. And he found a way to get inside, but he wasn't doing anything. And you had them under total control. <coughs> it was a worthy fight, though. You Sorry, it was a worthy fight. No, no, you you won it though. You you bossed it. No, it was a worthy <coughs> fight to take part in. As, as yeah, a, he, he was a he, he didn't. We watched the fight. He never stopped coming forward. No, no, he was that up man had, That, that yeah. man had like determination. Yeah. yeah, but you were just a better fighter, oh, I, yeah, I, yeah. I, and. Um, you know, it was a deserved victory at the end. How did it feel when you won it? Did, was, was, did, you know, was per, it a, like a personal satisfaction. Yeah. Felt good. Did you felt you'd, you'd come to the end of the journey? Yeah, I did. Oh, you, you, got, you know, all your memories skipping back to your head, don't you? Mm-hmm. And then you remember everything. Probably remember that, but I remember being in the shower feeling very... Was it emotional? I remember. Um, I think one of them little, <laughs> them little. <laughs> Thank fuck, it's over. <laughs> I've no, been like ba- I haven't been gonna get back in there. Them again. little emotional <laughs> things, but you, yeah. you're about to cry, but you don't. So yeah. I mean, mm. I remember getting something like a little judder in the shower, but yeah, yeah. It felt, it felt, it felt good. It felt personally good. Mm. But it, look, it's one of them. Unless you're all, unless you're all lights and the cameras and the money involved. Everyone around it ain't celebrating. Fuck them. them. Fuck them. But no, no, it's, it's, I'm, it's just ma- I'm just making a clear point that the celebrations weren't weren't large celebrations. But it, there's it something per- interesting personal, about that. Personal celebration. There's something interesting about about that 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 whole setup, that whole scene of going up to Paisley, of, of it being a tough, arduous journey, even to get to the boxing um, venue, mm. and it wasn't a glamorous event. Oh. Yeah, there wasn't fellas there in, in tuxedos and dicky bows, right? And it was perfect for your story. You know what I mean? It just suited your your particular struggle, right? And, and I, I think, um, you know, I, I think there's something um, perfect about it for the way it capped off your 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 story, and uh, I think it's great. Cast off my fight story, I yeah, agree. But yeah. that was probably the beginning of the show, I had another story, but, but well, so, what I, what I was, was too long already. So what we we can move on to that was that watching the fight, I was like, watching it thinking, why is he fucking standing up between rounds? He's 42, right? Is like, is this like some psychological um, ploy he's trying to use against his opponent to think look at me I'm not tired I'm not tired and I couldn't get my head around it you know I was like why is he standing up between rounds and then I found a video of you on YouTube in which you're doing a, a Zoom uh, podcast with a guy called Andrew Fletcher Andrew K. Fletcher Andrew yeah. K. Fletcher yeah and I just found it by accident and it turns out that this was part of your plan this was a, a, a part of your training regime is that you were standing up between the rounds because you'd been practicing something called incline bed therapy. Yeah. And, you know, you credit this mm-hmm. in this interview on Zoom as part of the reason for your victory. So what do you want to know more about incline bed therapy? I want to know why you were standing up between rounds. Because Andrew who came to trust very much because of the, the benefit I was getting through incline and be bed, something as simple as incline. You need to go on incline bed therapy if you're interested in your health, by the way, because it's absolutely monumental. So recovery for athletes and all the benefits of good things happening to your body to such a simple and effective measure as this. But you need to research yourself. We have more time to explain it. But in the fight, Andrew, who were trusted, I said to me, don't sit down. No one even knows why they sit down during Jordan fights because it doesn't do them any benefit circulation wise. If you were to ask anyone, no one would have a real answer for you and did. It's just it's just a it's just a uh, it's 
just something that's played out for generations because that's what's always been done. Do you know what I mean? Mm. But ask anyone and ask, <coughs> ask them why they do it. No one's really got an answer. If you think the way circulation works and shaking your arms, shaking your legs, I think Tyson Fury does it now as well. Hold mm. on. It just makes sense, doesn't it? Mm. If you sit down, gravity's only working half. If you lie down, gravity's pushing down. The circulation's not really working at all. If you stand up, everything's moving as it should. Well, what I thought and was, my body didn't fatigue once in that fight. Well, that's what I was going to say because I'd seen some other fights you'd done and uh, one or two of them I noticed you were gassing midway through the I fight. I down to the training camp. Though. Right. So, but with this one, you weren't at the age of 42. Right, I thought your stamina and your endurance looked better than anything that I could find. Felt like that as well. Yeah, and then listening to that interview with Fletcher, in which you credit a lot of that success, right, with his inclined bed therapy, right, is that you felt as if your endurance and your fatigue levels were, you know, above and beyond allowing you to get through the fight. Now, but that's to discount me and Franny. No, no, it's, it's not. not. I was just as part of it. And no, I, it was I, just I a credit it, a massive part of it, but Franny was a massive part of it. Without Franny, it wouldn't happen. Without my determination, yeah, it was everything comes together. Of course. But watching that video with you, right, it was uh, it was so persuasive, right, is that immediately I went and found a load of books right, and sticked me, inclined me bed. Have you got benefits off it? Yeah, I think. Well, I think so. No, well, not as much, but I did. Yeah, yeah. So people snore, snore bad. People will snore if they incline the bed. They won't snore. Well, I snore. I, I incline the bed about seven inches, mm. right? Which is quite a lot because it's between six and nine, isn't it? Mm. Yeah, and uh, it takes a bit of time to get used to because you're sliding down the bed, aren't you? At first, but that's good for your skeletal system, no? Yeah, well, well, I've, that was maybe eight weeks ago. And I'm still on the incline bed, and yeah, I'm sleeping a lot better. So my whole family sleeps like that. But it, what's interesting is that is that by coincidence or by accident, me watching you do that uh, fight and then finding that Zoom call is, is you know is improved my sleep. <laughs> that's sleep, what I'm saying. It's, all, but it's help. yeah. Well, it, the start of me sleep for me because that's that's a, an important part of me health. But you know that's the. The, the knock-on effect sometimes of um, relationships with people. but Cool. Okay, so you won the title. What happened then? It's back to normal life. Yeah, but is, did you definitely retire at that point? I think so, yeah. I, I, had, I had ideas going back to MMA. Yeah. And I, would, uh, and, I, and I took them seriously for a few months. I went to the next generation MMA. Because what I realised was I thought, if I, if I got this clinical sort of response off from it, People they asked in MMA, they were saying that Paul Rimmer of uh, Next Gen, he was like a clinical, he, was like, he looked at things clinically in order to improve mm. a fighter's weaknesses. Mm. That makes sense. Mm. And I had no time to waste. So I went to Paul, said, look, Paul, would you, would, you, would you consider taking me on and would you consider just ironing out? I just need to fine-tune me not going to the floor so I can just continue striking and mm. then I wanted to go back and win a, a cage warriors well that was the intention because <laughs> it would have been nice wouldn't it when she's gonna go bo- back into the MMA. world title an <laughs> MMA world title yeah. and a karate I've won a karate world title by mm. the way as well so I was thinking a trilogy of titles still would have been shit money still would have been loads of time yeah. and effort for shit money but I wanted that accreditation mm. so I'll play it but then yeah, me missus got pregnant <laughs> with the fifth child and I thought, nah. That's just too far. Just the bridge yeah, too far. Body, body, yeah, body are just tough. So how old are you now? 45? 47. 47. Yeah. So when are, you, when are you getting back in the ring again? <laughs> Have you got one more fight left in you? Know what? what me, um, <laughs> th- them feelings are all gone now. Are they? Yeah. Really, truly, yeah. Yeah. I should, if you walked in today and said I'd give you five hundred grand, <laughs> I'd be like, it'd only be money that would motivate me. Yeah. But not that's not, that's oh, I tell a lie, yeah. Because uh, Conor McGregor's good mate, Artem Lobov, and I know Artem from the MMA days. Me and Artem get on pretty good. And he brought, he come over to Liverpool, brought him to the club where they work on. Um, <coughs> caught up because we used to go out in the pool together, me and Artem. Back in the, the Olympia days, he's done well at him, and um, he was fighting bare knuckle in America, <laughs> and he got two hundred and fifty grand against uh, Paulio Mag- Magalaji, I think his name is, and he said, "I'll try and get you on the promotion." 
So I'm thinking like... She's going to be doing bare knuckles now, are you This was last year. <laughs> Arthur was telling me this, telling me the money he got. I shouldn't have said that really. Would that. you do it? No, I was going to do it. Right, okay. Because I thought the money was going to be decent. Yeah. But it wasn't. Yeah. So, Arthur's a good mate of Conor McGregor's. Arthur's mm. got good... Um, I think he's been in the UFC as well. Yeah, Arthur's a machine, but... He's, he's obviously got good connections. And, that, yeah. That's the thing with Tyson. He's, you know, it was, he was on Joe Rogan and he was asked, you know, why did you come back and have a fight? Because I, I got a call from a promoter saying, if I give you 40 million, would you get back wow. in the ring? That's a lot of money. <laughs> that's a lot of money, isn't it? You know, yeah. And he, initially it was going to be a, an exhibition match. And Roy Jones come on board as a, a, it was an exhibition match. And then, you know, it turns out pretty quickly that. There wasn't going to be no exhibition. It was Tyson's going in there. And he wanted to knock him out, and it was going to be under Queensby rules and judges. And but yeah, that was uh, that was his motivation. Mm. Just looking rough, Tyson, isn't he? Rough yeah. as in like yeah, tough, tough, yeah, rough. yeah, yeah. yeah. Cool. Okay, so what are you doing now, Tal? I mean, how was how was the the career change? I'm just I'm just being me now more than ever I ever have been, and I like being me. So whatever that means in terms of trying to offer a description can't really say I'm just comfortable in my own skin just comfortable in my own skin I'm a happy man faced all my demons I suppose mm. um, done a lot of self introspection that's past few years probably been my best years because I've, I've, I've delved I've delved deeply into my own soul and I've come up with a lot of uh, understanding faced a lot of fears a lot of insecure, things that like you think, wow, how did how did they even mean so much to me? Mm. But they do, and we've all got them. And do you see is, yourself as a coach yourself, a mentor. Do you think you can coach fighters? Yeah, but I don't know if I want to. Really, I do coach fighters, but it's 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 about me earning a living rather than me partaking in something that I enjoy. Do you know what I mean by yeah. that? Yeah, that that would be a passion rather than a yeah. And a, an income. I have to aim for five kids, so it's your fault. I've got to do my. <laughs> I've just got to do my work. My work comes from yeah, the work I do. Mm. My income comes from the work I do. Me, so until the kids are older, then I won't be partaking in anymore. Is there something you think in the future? I'm passionate about writing. I'm passionate about okay. creative elements of myself. Now, what like, are you writing? Do the poetry for Sim Mission. Okay, Sim Mission label. Do you perform it? I have done. Yeah. I've done on it. Paul Smith, the uh, comedian, used to run a poetry um, sort of recital play. So I've done all that. Played around with a few different things, but you know what? I just like being... I, I like my own time now. I like being on my own. I, I remember like, your stand-up oh, face. Yeah. Oh, it's it. really good. <laughs> it's hard a bit of everything. It was funny, the stand-up face. I've tried a bit of all of it, yeah. yeah. I remember you took me to Hot Water Club oh. that time, do you remember? I done was well like, twice and then died on stage twice. Did you? They were harsh experiences. But again, learn I just listen. I just told myself in. Yeah. I have a go. Yeah. I'm a try. Yeah. yeah. But I'm happy. I'm happy with what I've tried and what I've not even what I've achieved. I'm just happy knowing who I am. Mm. I'm happy being me. All right. I'm happy being me. That's a perfect place to to draw an end to this uh, conversation, which I'm hopeful that we can do it again and we can uh, keep it going. And really enjoyed listening to it, mate. And uh, thanks so much for. Agreeing to come on and thanks for the invite. Yeah, then we'll. Uh, and thanks for having you've offered my life as well. Yeah, that's right. You've, you've yeah. Um, you brought a lot of structure to my life in different <laughs> ways. Great stuff. Cool. It's right, Tony. Cheers, brother. Nice one, man.